It all happened during June 2014, while I was on a much-needed break from work. I hadn't been camping since I was a kid, so it seemed like the perfect opportunity for me to reconnect with nature and hopefully alleviate some stress. My girlfriend, Martha Weatherly, and I decided to rent an RV and embark on a week-long road trip across rural Idaho, stopping in various parks and small towns along the way. Our trip had been going smoothly until about halfway through, when we stopped in Laughlin Ridge Recreational Park, a picturesque place with a large lake surrounded by thick woods famous for its hiking trails and fishing spots. As we were getting ready to eat dinner by the lakeshore, we noticed a group of people gathered around something they'd found washed up on the shore. Intrigued, we went over to take a look, and our eyes widened in horror at the sight before us. The corpse of a man lay there, his skin mottled from exposure to the water and gruesome wounds covering his torso. Several fishing hooks protruded from his skin, their hooks embedded deep within him. The scene was grisly and disturbing, not what you'd expect to see in such an idyllic location. Naturally, everyone at the park was shaken up by this discovery. Authorities were notified but informed us that they were stretched thin due to an ongoing issue in a nearby town. While they would send someone as soon as possible, it might be several hours before they could arrive. Feeling unsettled yet captivated by this strange turn of events, we returned to our RV with every intention to hunker down until morning. As night fell, Martha and I became increasingly wary of every sound outside. Neither of us admitted it at the time, but our nerves were frayed by the gruesome sighting earlier that day. Just as we were about to turn in for the night around midnight, a loud bang jolted us out of our attempted calm. We rushed to the window, hearts pounding as we tried to discern the source of the noise. It was then that we saw him a man standing by a tree, his scraggly beard obscuring much of his face, but his wide eyes glinting maliciously in the faint moonlight. He wasn't much taller than an average man, but there was something about him that seemed unnatural. Maybe it was his hunched posture or his unnaturally gaunt frame. He was shirtless and covered in mud and grime, the darkness hiding everything but his glaring eyes. The man suddenly let out an unsettling cackle and started making lewd gestures towards us. Panic rising in my chest, I quickly locked all our doors and windows while Martha frantically dialed 911 to report what was happening. As we waited for her call to connect, our fear rapidly escalating as the man's taunting continued, we suddenly heard another terrifying sound the distant screams of another camper. With only a small flashlight to guide us, we cursed ourselves for not packing anything more powerful. We ventured outside to investigate. My breathing hastened as I recalled the horror movie cliches I'd laughed off before. Now I was living in one. We reached a nearby campsite. Another RV demolished beyond recognition, its insides torn apart, underscore literally underscore. Blood stained the remnants, mingling with shattered glass and bits of debris. The couple who'd been staying there were no longer recognizable, their bodies so brutally mangled it would have been easier to look away. I... I think we need to leave now. Martha trembled next to me. Whatever this is, maybe it's related to, you know... I nodded in agreement. This peaceful camping trip had turned into something far more sinister than we could have imagined. Gathering our belongings at a breakneck pace, we scrambled to leave. I rushed out to the driver's side of the RV when it happened. As I approached the driver's side of the RV, I heard footsteps behind me. I turned around just in time to see the gaunt man lunging at me with a rusty knife in his hand. I ducked, narrowly avoiding the blade, 
and stumbled away from him. Martha! Get in the RV and lock the door! I yelled as I continued to back away. She followed my instructions without hesitation, her eyes wide with terror. Having no other choice but to face this man-man, I picked up a large rock nearby and hurled it at him. He dodged it with surprising agility, but it bought me just enough time to dive into the RV and lock the door behind me. We need to get out of here now, Martha said urgently. I nodded and started up the engine as she hung up from her 911 call. As we drove away from the campsite, I could see the violent man chasing after us, still brandishing that horrifying knife. My hands shook with adrenaline as I sped down the road, trying to put as much distance between us and danger as possible. Did you get through to 911? I asked Martha once we were certain we had escaped immediate harm. Yes, she replied hurriedly. But they said it would take some time for help to arrive. They're dealing with multiple emergency calls right now. It seemed that we weren't his only victims that night. While driving away from that sinister place, we saw several damaged vehicles and signs of struggle in other campsites. We finally reached a small town an hour later and immediately noticed its eerily quiet atmosphere. The streets were deserted and several storefronts were splattered with blood. My heart sank as I realized that whatever was happening extended far beyond our isolated camping trip. This nightmare had consumed the entire region. With no immediate law enforcement or medical aid available, Martha and I decided that our best course of action would be to continue driving until we found help, keeping an eye on the local radio for updates about the situation. As we made our way through unfamiliar roads, we stumbled upon a group of survivors huddled in a makeshift shelter. They explained that the man we encountered was not alone. There were several deranged individuals spreading violence and chaos throughout the area. A mysterious trigger had sent these people into a horrifying, murderous frenzy. We took turns driving throughout the night, determined to reach safety. The grisly scenes we passed only served to strengthen our resolve. Entire families had been torn apart by these violent individuals. We encountered more survivors on our route, people with bloodied faces and tears in their eyes, all desperate to escape the nightmare that had descended upon them. On the third day of our escape, we finally arrived at a large city where law enforcement had managed to establish some semblance of security. As we entered an emergency shelter, other survivors shared stories similar to our own, forming bonds of solidarity amidst the pain and trauma. After several weeks spent in an emergency shelter, authorities were finally able to regain control of the situation. The perpetrators behind these violent attacks were captured, but it did little to soothe the anguish caused by their reign of terror. Weeks turned into months as life slowly began returning to normal for the towns affected by these gruesome events. And though many tried their hardest to move on from this tragedy, we would never forget those who lost their lives during those harrowing days. As for Martha and me... We made it through together but forever changed by what we've experienced. We chose not to return to camping or even venture into secluded places for fear of encountering any other psychotic individuals like those who tore apart so many innocent lives. Instead, we dedicated ourselves to providing support for others who were affected by this ordeal. We formed a survivor's group aimed at helping people who lived through similar events heal and find hope in the aftermath. And although we knew that life would never be the same, we chose to face the uncertainty and pain of our new reality together, united by our shared trauma and our unwavering determination to rebuild what had been so ruthlessly destroyed.
It was mid-October when I decided to take a break from the hustle and bustle of city living and treat myself to a week-long camping trip in the Appalachian Mountains. I felt more at ease being away from civilization, just me and my faithful dog, Jeffrey. Little did I know that this seemingly peaceful trip would take an unexpected, sinister turn. My RV was parked at one of those quaint little campsites you find scattered alongside the national parks. It was an ideal spot, surrounded by dense woods and close to a freshwater stream. I struck up a conversation with another camper named Jerry Mason. We spoke about our love for outdoor activities, trading tips on camping hacks and laughing about the occasional challenges we faced during our adventures. The night before my terrifying experience, I had invited Jerry to join me for dinner. We had shared more stories, with some friendly banter thrown in. The atmosphere was lighthearted, that is, until Jerry mentioned his great uncle who had disappeared mysteriously near this very site in the 1960s. He hinted at foul play but eventually dismissed it as a figment of his overactive imagination. The next morning, Jerry walked over with steaming cups of coffee in hand. He jokingly said that this would take care of any lingering fears brought on by his ghost story from the night before. As we stood there sipping our coffee and watching the mist rise above the trees, there was no way for either of us to foresee the gruesome experience awaiting us only a few hours later. Jerry left soon after breakfast as he'd planned a long hike that day and wanted an early start. Jeffrey and I went for a leisurely walk around the campsite, enjoying a once-in-a-lifetime moment when we came across an owl perched on a low branch. Little did we know that this majestic sight would be upstaged by something far more sinister later on. Just after lunch, as I was preparing to settle down with a book, I heard a blood-curdling scream that shattered the tranquility. Instinctively, I sprang into action, grabbing the Winchester rifle I kept in the RV for emergencies. Jeffrey barked insistently, his instincts also urging him to address the source of the threat. I didn't know where the scream had come from or who it belonged to, but my gut told me that someone was in dire need of help. Jeffrey and I cautiously made our way through the woods, following the screams that echoed eerily through the trees. As we approached the scene, I began to gag when a putrid stench filled my nostrils. It smelled like death. The origin of this stench became horrifyingly clear as we stepped into a small clearing. There, in a metal trailer belonging to another camper, lay what seemed like human body parts scattered chaotically across the ground and smeared with blood. It looked like someone had taken out their rage on them and reduced them to lifeless hunks of torn flesh. Terrified by a rose in my throat as Jeffrey whimpered anxiously beside me, my gaze shifted from the gruesome scene before me towards an unfamiliar man who stood by wearily observing us with an odd grin on his face. His glasses were crooked, and there was something about his eyes cold and unfeeling like those of a shark that sent shivers down my spine. Despite everything happening around us, he made no attempt to react or explain the horrors lying before him. Simply staring at me with that same twisted smile and cautioning gaze as if daring me to challenge him on it. I hesitated for a moment wanting to call for help but feeling inexplicably frozen in place. It was as if this man's unblinking stare had some bizarre power over me. Jeffrey, however, snapped out of it and bared his teeth, growling at the stranger menacingly. The intimidating sound seemed to stir something within me, and I regained control of my actions. Stay back, I warned the stranger, clutching the rifle tightly. If you don't explain yourself right now, I'll call the police. Despite my warning, he just kept smiling that eerie grin and didn't say a word. 
It was then that I glanced over at his hands and noticed they were smeared with blood. Was he responsible for this carnage? Out of the corner of my eye, I noticed another camper tentatively approaching from the clearing's edge. This person seemed different. Their look of alarm and utter shock indicated they had just stumbled upon the grisly sight as well. What's going on? They asked frantically from a distance. Hearing a new voice brought me back to reality. Seizing the opportunity, I finally managed to pull out my phone and dialed 911, keeping an eye on the bloody man while alerting them to our situation. He didn't seem to care that help was on its way. Instead, he calmly began to walk towards us. In response to his advance, I raised my rifle and pointed it directly at him. Stop right there! The police are coming! I shouted forcefully. This only seemed to make his smile widen even more unnervingly. As he continued towards us without any concern for his own safety or consequences, I realized we couldn't wait for help any longer we needed to protect ourselves now. Everyone, run! I yelled at the small group gathered around the clearing before firing a warning shot into the air. The other campers didn't hesitate and immediately scattered, as did Jeffrey and I. We sprinted through the forest, the twisting trees feeling like a maze meant to keep us trapped and disoriented. The smell of death still lingered, a chilling reminder of the brutality that awaited us if caught by our pursuer. We finally reached our RV after what felt like an eternity of running slamming the door shut behind us. Bracing myself against it, I quickly looked around outside to ascertain if he had followed us. As Jeffrey stood guard by my side, our breaths coming in rapid spurts from fear and exertion, we saw the stranger slowly approach. As he emerged from the shadows, I noticed just how tall he was. His torso and legs were unnaturally elongated. He stood there for a moment before walking away abruptly, vanishing back into the woods. It was then that I pondered about his motivations. What would make someone commit such atrocities with no apparent remorse? Police sirens in the distance interrupted my thoughts, and I whispered a prayer of thanks for their arrival. With their help, the other campers were escorted to safety while an extensive search began for any sign of that sinister individual. The following days were filled with tense anticipation and investigation work by local authorities. It turned out that our attacker had mutilated four people in that horrific scene, each victim unrecognizable due to the extent of their injuries. In the end, they never apprehended him. He seemed to have disappeared without a trace into those vast woods, just as silently as he had arrived, causing destruction in his wake. We all suspected that he was still out there somewhere, potentially lurking and plotting his next gruesome pursuit. Although my life eventually returned to some semblance of normalcy, I would forever be haunted by that surreal encounter with evil and human form. Every now and then when I remembered those whose lives were brutally extinguished, an unsettling sense of survivor's guilt washed over me, and I stared warily into the shadows, wondering if he'd ever reemerge. The faint aroma of burning wood and the sound of crackling embers filled the chilly October air in Yosemite National Park. It was 1985, and as always, I was excited to set out on another camping trip with a few family friends. The group consisted of myself, Morris, Jamie, and Alex. We all grew up together bonded by our parents' inexplicable bond through even the roughest times. Alex was busy assembling the tents while Morris and Jamie played cards on a makeshift table outside our rented RV. 
The sun dipped below the horizon faster than we'd anticipated turning the skies into a canvas of deep blues and oranges as night approached. We couldn't tell it right then, but that particular night was about to take a turn for the worse. The fire! I suddenly heard Alex murmur, brows furrowed in concern as she pointed toward the burning pile of logs near our campsite. One of our fire logs had rolled off from its original stack, getting dangerously close to the dry autumn foliage nearby. Gingerly picking it up with a pair of tongs, I moved it back into place before things got out of hand. We all exchanged an uneasy chuckle at this small mishap, shaking off any remaining tension before heading back to our respective tasks. Morris picked up his harmonica and started playing some tunes to lighten up the mood. Later that evening, satiated by Alex's exquisite barbecue skills, we were lounging around the dying fire when we heard footsteps crunching on dead leaves in the darkness beyond our campsite perimeter. Assuming it was simply other campers wandering around at night or frightened, or perhaps overly curious, wildlife checking us out from a distance, we went back to chatting and laughing at each other's corny jokes until finally retiring for the night. It wasn't until later when we switched off all our lights that I noticed something odd in the darkness outside the RV. Two beady, glowing eyes staring back at me from a significant distance. The unrelenting gaze belonged to a man, his face caked with dirt and dried blood, wearing a sinister grin. My heart raced, but I couldn't muster the courage to scream. The stranger's smile widened, revealing teeth that appeared unnervingly sharp. As if aware how unnerved I was by his presence, he slowly turned around and vanished into the dark. What's wrong? You look like you've seen a ghost, Alex asked as she noticed my petrified expression. Feigned laughter filled the confined RV space as I tried to brush it off, saying it was only my mind playing tricks on me in the dark. Morning came, and we decided to explore the area around our campsite after a light breakfast. Morris ventured off on his own towards an adjacent path that he claimed would eventually circle back to our location. We waved him off as he disappeared into the woods, fully oblivious to its hidden dangers. Time went by, as did occasional jokes, when we heard Bones' chilling screams tearing through the forest followed by bursts of rapid footsteps pounding against the gravel paths nearby. We panicked, sprinting toward the direction Morris had taken earlier. Deep down, we all feared that he might have met with something gruesome, or worse yet, that same sinister figure from last night. We searched for what felt like hours when we suddenly stumbled upon an appalling sight, our good friend Morris lying on the ground amid a pool of blood and teeth fragments scattered all around him. He was gasping for breath with strange marks all over him, long gashes which appeared as if the perpetrator had penned them with sharpened fingernails. I saw him, Morris whispered, unable to provide any more details before succumbing to unconsciousness. Meanwhile, another chilling realization crept its way into my thoughts. That sinister man I had seen smiling through the darkness didn't just exist in my mind. He was real, and now we two were pawns in his wicked game. We decided it was best to get Morris back to the RV for immediate medical attention. Alex and I helped him up and carried him, hurriedly making our way through the woods. Our concern deepened with the understanding that the sinister man could be lurking nearby, waiting for another opportunity to strike. Upon reaching the RV, we did our best to clean and bandage Morris's wounds. Unsure if he would regain consciousness any time soon, we debated on whether or not we should call for help. Ultimately, fearing that calling for help might expose others to danger, or even invite further attacks from the demented stalker, we agreed to stick together 
and stay alert. As daylight slowly faded away, a fearful anxiety filled the air while we discussed our options. Staying put would leave us vulnerable, but venturing out in search of help posed its risks too. We finally resolved that Alex would stay with Morris in the RV while I went to find any sign of help at a nearby gas station or possibly a ranger's station. I meticulously locked the RV doors and windows before setting off on my search. With each step along the dimly lit path, I couldn't help but feel that malevolent eyes were watching my every move. The man's twisted face and bloodied grin were etched in my mind, serving as a gruesome warning that danger was never far behind. After walking what felt like miles through the darkening forest, I stumbled upon a ranger's station located at a trailhead near our campsite. A sense of relief washed over me as I banged on the door, desperately hoping for assistance. A male ranger opened up. The clear look of authority in his eyes gave me momentary comfort. I feverishly recounted our horrifying experience with the sinister man and asked if I could use their phone to call for help. They had no cell reception either but thankfully had a landline available. The ranger listened to my story with genuine concern and offered to drive me back to the RV. He also dispatched additional rangers to secure the area and search for the dangerous man. As we pulled up to our campsite, I hurriedly unlocked the RV door, fearing for the safety of Alex and Morris. To my relief, both were still inside, and Morris's condition seemed stable. The rangers set up a makeshift perimeter around our campsite and began searching throughout the night. Although I was unharmed, thoughts of what had happened consumed me, as well as an utter fear for our lives. The following morning, one of the rangers informed us that they had found traces of the man's presence in the area but hadn't been able to locate him. He advised us to pack up and leave immediately while they continued their search. With heavy hearts, we decided it was time to return home. The danger was simply too great. While packing our things, we couldn't help but think of those bloody teeth fragments surrounding Morris in the woods. The memory served as a stark reminder of the horrors we'd discovered lurking in the shadows, an unnerving reality none of us could ever forget. Morris was eventually taken to a hospital where he received proper treatment for his injuries. As for the sinister figure who'd been stalking us, we never heard any news about his capture or whereabouts again. We uneasily returned home, whispering silent prayers that we'd never encounter him again, and that no one else would face such torment either. From that fateful camping trip, our lives were forever changed. We constantly looked over our shoulders perpetually feeling watched by an unknown entity lingering somewhere close by. One thing was certain, that nightmarish experience would haunt us for the rest of our lives. It was the month of May. Back in 1993 when I decided to take a summer break from the bustling city life to unwind in the calming ambience of nature. My name is Maxwell Jenkins, and I was on my way to the mesmerizing landscapes of Lake Elsinore in California. As a high school math teacher, I was used to days filled with logic and calculations but this time around... I wanted to escape the rules that govern our world time and numbers. It was a Thursday evening when I finally reached my destination. The beautiful sun shone brightly over the horizon painting a breathtaking scenery. I chose an ideal spot on the lakeside for parking my RV. I had packed everything essential for my short camping trip food, water, camping equipment, and some of my favorite books. As night approached, I prepared a small campfire and cooked up some burgers and vegetable skewers. While eating, 
I noticed that beyond the warm glow of the fire lay an unsettling darkness that stretched across the forest. Two days had passed since I arrived at Lake Elsinore when something unusual began happening which made me question if this vacation would remain as peaceful as it seemed so far. Around midnight on Saturday, while resting peacefully inside my RV, suddenly there were abrupt knocks on the door that jolted me awake. Still groggy from sleep, I attempted to ignore the sounds attributing them to wild animals roaming around at night. But soon, another distinct banging noise made it evident that someone or something was deliberately trying to get my attention. Drugged by curiosity and uncertain about what awaited outside, I reluctantly opened the door only to find nobody there. However, just around thirty feet away from my RV lied an overturned trash can with its contents thrown all over the place. An unnerving feeling rose within me something didn't seem right with this whole scenario. Common sense demanded that I call for help, but being in such a remote area, cell reception was almost non-existent. I decided to get some sleep and inspect my surroundings the next day. Little did I know that my decision would leave indelible marks on my mind forever. It was Sunday morning when I took a walk around the campsite, hoping to find some clues about last night's incident. While exploring, I stumbled upon a trail that led deeper into the woods. I followed it cautiously until it took me to a clearing where I saw something that would haunt me forever. Before my very eyes laid a macabre scene what appeared to be the remains of a human, except it wasn't just one person, but various body parts scattered across the ground. The way those mutilated limbs and organs were displayed reminded me of some twisted art piece, designed to incite fear and disgust. My guts churned at this horrifyingly grotesque sight. I knew then that this was no longer a safe place. I needed to leave immediately. However, while retracing my steps to run back to the safety of my RV, I sensed someone watching me. As the sensation grew unbearable, I couldn't help but look behind me. There he stood in the shadows. A tall man with unkempt hair and wild eyes filled with ferocity distanced about twenty feet from me. His features were barely visible in the dim light, but one thing was clear he looked dangerous. He slowly started advancing towards me as dread ran through my veins. Panic surged through my body as the menacing man approached me. My instincts screamed at me to flee, but I resisted the urge momentarily, trying to think of a better way to escape. I remembered that my RV had a small emergency phone hidden in a compartment near the dash. Although cell reception in this remote area was unreliable, it was worth a shot. I abruptly turned and sprinted back towards my RV, hoping that the wild-eyed man wouldn't follow me. As I ran, I prayed that I would get there before he caught up to me. When I finally reached my vehicle, I frantically searched for the emergency phone while keeping an eye on the door. Not a moment too soon, I found it just as the crazed man reached my RV. The door banged violently as he tried to force his way inside. My trembling hands punched 911 into the keypad as I desperately hoped for a connection. 911, what's your emergency? The operator's voice barely came through with static interruptions. There's a man. He's trying to break into my RV. Please send help. I shouted without taking any chances to be vague. Stay on the line. We're getting your location. The operator instructed. Do you know this man? What does he look like? No, I don't know who he is. I replied. He's tall, unkempt hair, terrifying eyes, and looks extremely dangerous. The sound of shattered glass filled my ears as the madman broke one of the windows and started climbing inside. 
Quick! Someone's breaking in! I need help now! I yelled into the phone as I scrambled towards the back of the RV. Footsteps echoed behind me as he came farther into my temporary sanctuary. Adrenaline pumping through my veins sparked a surge of strength, and without thinking further, I threw open an emergency exit window and climbed out. The metallic taste of fear lingered in my mouth as I ran towards the nearest campground, praying that someone could help me. Once there, I found campers and alertly shouted for help. They immediately saw the panic on my face and came running without question. What's wrong? One of them asked hurriedly, while another called for more people to come over. Before I could respond, the wild-eyed man appeared from the tree line. Several campers quickly grabbed nearby items to defend themselves and me while others guided me towards safety. I've already called the police! I blurted out to the campers as they stood their ground against the oncoming foe. The madman seemed taken aback by the presence of so many people mustering against him. He hesitated and scowled, clearly calculating his chances before finally retreating into the woods. A police siren could be heard in the distance along with a faint vibration through my fingers that was still connected to 911 but had dropped it due to sheer panic. The group of campers took me in while we waited for the police to arrive. They reassured me that they wouldn't let that man near me again. The warmth of their kindness brought a sense of security, something I desperately needed at that moment. When law enforcement officers arrived, they asked for details about the man-man and took note of my account from earlier incident with many supporting witnesses now by my side. Days later, police would apprehend the wild-eyed man responsible for everything. It turned out he was a notorious murderer with a prolific record, having claimed numerous victims in similarly heinous manners. I knew then and there that if it hadn't been for those brave campers rallying around to protect me, I might have been another tragic loss added to his count. Though it was undoubtedly an experience straight out of nightmares, I'm grateful for those who had the courage to stand by a stranger that fateful day. The campers showed me that there's still hope, goodness, and solidarity among people even in the most terrifying of situations. As I sat in the safety of my home days later, I whispered a silent prayer for the victims who never had this chance to be saved, forever leaving an indelible mark on my life. It was during that bizarre October heatwave in 2011 when I decided to take my new RV out for a camping trip in the isolated forests of Wyoming. Thought it would provide a cooling relief from the sweltering heat. Little did I know, I would come face to face with terror. I arrived at the campsite early in the morning, when the sun was still hidden behind the mountains. The site was surrounded by tall trees and lush greenery, with only the sound of birds chirping overhead. My dog Max was accompanying me, excitedly sniffing around and marking his territory. As I began setting up the campsite, a large group of hikers walked by making friendly conversation. They joked about how long it had been since they had seen civilization and warned me about some strange sightings in the area recently. A man in dark clothing lurking near some campsites, but hadn't AT stolen anything or harmed anyone. Despite their slightly scary stories, they were mostly amusing themselves and left laughing. I went on with my day, enjoying my time in nature and delicious barbecue. As evening approached, Max quickly retreated into the RV while I sat outside enjoying a beautiful sunset slowly dissolving into darkness. The crackle of burning wood echoed through the night as I warmed myself by the fire. Suddenly, 
Max went incredibly still, ears perked up before letting out a low growl towards the dense woods nearby. A rustling sound emerged from within it. As any dog owner would do when their pet starts growling at something that seems inexplicable to their human senses, I tried to make light of it all. What do you think's out there, Max? Bigfoot? As if on cue, a figure emerged from the forest line definitely not Bigfoot, but equally unsettling. A tall man with long unkempt hair and a dirty white shirt clenched tightly around his thin frame stepped into view. He looked weak, almost fragile, but there was an unmistakable malice in his hollow eyes. Max immediately began barking voraciously, blocking the intruder's path as I attempted to regain my composure. I kept my gaze on this mysterious man lingering just beyond our firelight trying to understand his presence and intentions. He remained still, staring in our direction before slowly closing the distance between us. Max snarled and lunged towards him, only to be picked up suddenly by what seemed like a set of wiry strong hands that hadn't revealed how powerful they could be. In a flash, he threw poor Max into the bushes on the side with no regard whatsoever for the well-being of the animal. Adrenaline coursed through my veins as I stood up, realizing that I was no longer uncertain about anything this stranger had on his mind or what he intended for me. It was clear that he harbored sinister plans and my survival instinct kicked in. There was nothing in what seemed like a logical next step that could have been subjected to questions or bruises for understanding what would unfold soon after. The man switched on a blowtorch with shaky hands and approached me with malicious intent. His eyes, shimmering in flames, burned with sadistic pleasure. In that exact moment of horror which seemed like an eternity in itself, Without any warnings or prior plans even known by fate for how things would unfold or occur reality struck like a ton of bricks on everyone present at various distances from this particular scene. Max leaped out from the bushes with violent rage against his attacker, biting into his leg viciously before disappearing back into darkness, offering me just enough time to stumble into the RV in chaos and confusion around me. Locking the door frantically behind me as our assailant's shrieking cry of pain echoed around us, mixed now with sounds unheard before which only added fuel for fear. Crashing, glass breaking, metal ripping and shredding through the air. I knew I had to call for help, but my phone was in the RV's glove compartment, away from me. Despite the chaos outside, I had to reach it. I crawled across the floor, keeping low to avoid being seen through any windows. My heart pounded in my chest as I finally reached the glove compartment and grabbed my phone. Before dialing 911, I texted my closest friend, John, who lived not far from our campsite. He needed to know what was happening. The message was brief. Attacked at campsite, need help. My hands trembled as the 911 operator answered my call. I whispered the details of our location and the events that transpired, trying my best to remain calm and composed despite knowing that danger was inches away from me. The operator assured me that help was on its way and advised me to stay hidden and quiet. Meanwhile, the intruder was still outside. His blowtorch continued to flare intermittently, its distinct sound signaling his ongoing destruction. Thanks to Max's quick intervention, his attention seemed partially diverted from me. From time to time, I could hear him wincing in pain and cursing as he stepped with his injured leg. It seemed like he got more furious with each passing second. As precious minutes slipped by agonizingly slow, I prayed feverishly for John or the police to arrive before this monstrous man found a way into the RV. Finally, after what felt like hours compressed into minutes, 
I heard a vehicle approaching from a distance, familiar tires crunching on gravel as it drew closer. It was John's truck. The intruder must have heard it too because his destruction halted almost immediately. A moment later there was silence, the first peaceful sound since this nightmare began. As soon as John's truck came into full view, we locked eyes through the RV's windshield, relief washing over both of us. Just as he opened his door to step out, I noticed the intruder sneaking around the RV's side, his grip tightening around his blowtorch. I frantically gestured to John to fire a warning shot into the air with his shotgun, hoping that it would deter the man from attacking any further. Thankfully, my gambit worked. Startled by the sound, the intruder turned in fear before bolting into the dense forest underbrush. The police sirens became audible in the distance almost immediately after that, though it felt like an eternity until they finally reached us. They took my statement on what had happened and began canvassing the area for any trace of this violent individual. Max was found near the edge of camp, shaken but thankfully unharmed. I hugged him tightly when he limped back to me, my whole body trembling with relief. John stayed close by as well, offering support and comfort despite trying to hide his own apprehension for what could have unfolded if he had not arrived in time. In the following days, an investigation ensued. The identity of our attacker was revealed. A man who had been stalking campers for a while now in an attempt to satisfy his urge for violence. Although he managed to vanish that night, authorities located and apprehended him within a week. Upon his arrest, it came to light that he'd attacked multiple campsites before, taking pleasure in imposing terror upon unsuspecting victims. Thankfully, John and Max prevented him from succeeding on that dreadful night. My gratitude toward them knew no bounds. Once our lives had returned to a semblance of normalcy, we organized a small gathering in Max's honor, celebrating his bravery and teaching our loved ones about emergency preparedness during outdoor excursions. Though memories of that traumatic night will never fade entirely from our minds, we worked hard to find closure knowing we narrowly escaped a terrifying fate. I often think about those who weren't as fortunate, our hearts reaching out to the other victims. Ever since that night, I never go camping without ensuring safety measures are in place and always remind others of the importance of being vigilant, hoping that Max's bravery is a lesson we can all learn from. The air was heavy with anticipation. The camping trip had been months in the making and the fact that it was finally happening gave me a feeling of excitement I hadn't felt in years. Nathan, my ever-dependable and adventurous college friend, and his girlfriend Emily had chosen the perfect spot for our RV camping adventure. We found ourselves deep in a beautiful, isolated patch of woods nestled within the Catskill Mountains of New York. It was October 2019, and we were taking in the scent of crisp autumn leaves as we set up our campsite around our rented RV. I chuckled as Emily stumbled over her words trying to remember the punchline of a joke she'd heard earlier that day. With still no cell service to call for help or guidance, we relied on shared experiences, good humor, and camaraderie. As night fell upon us, the three of us huddled around the crackling fire roasting marshmallows while sharing spooky stories that never seemed to get old. However, shortly into this ritual-like chatter, a scream from afar sent shivers rippling through my body cutting short Emily's laughter. Did you hear that? Nathan asked with widened eyes. I don't like this, admitted Emily, instinctively seeking comfort by getting closer to Nathan. 
Relax, I said skeptically. It could have just been an animal. Deep down though I knew that that wasn't an animal's scream. It was human. Despite my attempts to calm things down and resume our activities, an uneasy atmosphere loomed over us for the rest of the evening. We retired early that night, each too troubled to admit how unnerved we were. Around midnight within the confined space of the RV, I awoke needing some fresh air. Right outside my window someone appeared to be fumbling with some kind of electrical equipment, someone uninvited. My heart raced as I tried to come to terms with what I was seeing. This intruder bore the cold, hard eyes of a stranger, and his hands were covered in blood as he tried to cut the wires of our generator with a jagged hunting knife. I nudged Nathan awake, terrified. There's someone out there. I whispered urgently. What? Where? He bolted upright and peered out the window. The light from the now-disabled generator barely illuminated the man's face before he disappeared into the darkness. We mustered the courage to venture out, armed with flashlights and an iron skillet we grabbed in haste. As we scanned the campsite for any signs of this menacing character, Emily spoke softly from her position near our fire pit. Guys, she stuttered, pointing her flashlight at an upturned tree nearby. What are those? Hanging from one of the newly exposed roots was a gruesome sight, human fingers dangling like macabre wind chimes, all severed seemingly at random. Horrified by the grisly image before us, Nathan turned to me. We need to get help. Now. I nodded in agreement, heart pounding even faster and louder than before, while Emily stifled a sob watching the grotesque display sway subtly in the soft breeze. The sense of urgency increased tenfold as we scrambled back into our RV, desperate to get away from that wretched scene. The terror clawed at us as we heard heavy footsteps approaching fast. As Nathan, Emily, and I huddled together in the RV, our hearts raced with fear. We knew we had to leave this gruesome scene immediately. Emily grabbed her phone to call for help, but we quickly realized there was no signal in this remote area. There's no service, she cried out in despair. Our only option now was to drive away from this nightmarish situation as fast as possible and head towards the nearest town for help. I started the engine, and we sped off into the darkness, leaving behind the severed fingers swaying in the wind. As we drove on the deserted road, I couldn't help but glance nervously at the rearview mirror every few seconds. My hands tightened on the steering wheel when I suddenly saw a figure emerging from the darkness. The blood-covered stranger from before appeared on the road behind us, running at an incredible speed to catch up with our RV. He was a large man with unkempt hair and a wild look in his eyes his intense expression seemed fueled by an insatiable hunger for violence. I stepped on the gas even harder pushing the vehicle to its limits. The man kept pace as if he were some nightmarish predator chasing its prey. Seeing him gaining on us, Nathan searched frantically for anything we could use to defend ourselves. He found a half-empty can of bear spray under one of the seats. The stranger was now dangerously close to our RV as I swerved onto a narrower road, lined with thick trees on either side. Emily urged me to slow down just enough for Nathan to crawl out onto the back ladder without falling. With immense bravery in his eyes, Nathan clutched the bear spray tightly and waited for the perfect moment. As I maintained my erratic pace along the narrow road, I heard Nathan yell out from behind us, Now! In an instant, he discharged the can of bear spray directly into the stranger's face who was mere inches from the RV. The man howled in pain and collapsed onto the road, 
allowing us to escape his deadly pursuit. We continued driving for what felt like hours until we finally saw the lights of a small town in the distance. Relief washed over us as we pulled into the nearest police station and ran inside to report the horrifying events we had just experienced. The officers listened intently to our story and immediately dispatched a team to investigate our campsite. They found evidence of the man's violent rampage, tools stained with blood, along with several mutilated corpses scattered throughout the surrounding woods. The man we encountered was eventually caught and identified as a notorious serial killer who had been evading capture for years. In the following days, I couldn't stop thinking about everything we had gone through, haunted by visions of those severed fingers hanging from that upturned tree root. But I also felt a deep sense of gratitude for Nathan's quick thinking and unflinching bravery. Without him, who knows if we would have survived that horrible night. As time passed, Emily, Nathan, and I somehow found our way back to normalcy. Although memories of that terrible night were still etched in our minds, they slowly became less overwhelming, allowing us to heal. And while we were forever changed by this harrowing experience, it taught us that no matter how dark or terrifying some moments may be, sticking together can save our lives. We never went camping again. I remember sitting there, chatting casually with my friends as we gathered around the fire, all of us excited for a much-needed weekend getaway. We had driven our RV to a picturesque location in Yellowstone National Park, eager to escape the hustle and bustle of daily life for a bit. I had always been skeptical about crime stories and unsettling encounters people talked about from their camping trips. Little did I know that this skepticism would be heavily tested later that very evening. My friend Bradley decided to share his idea of ghost pepper s mores, which he claimed were not only delicious but also added excitement to the regular s mores. Everyone agreed to give it a try, as we craved some thrill. To our surprise, they weren't half bad but left us rasping and gasping for air. As the night progressed, we continued engaging in conversation, laughing and reminiscing on past adventures when we suddenly heard a loud bang nearby. Initially dismissing it as rowdy campers or an animal searching for food, we shook off the interruption and returned to our stories. That's when Lydia noticed an eerily strange figure lingering in the distance a man wearing a tattered coat with grease-streaked hair that fell haphazardly across his scarred forehead. He appeared disoriented, but there was something menacing in the way he clutched at what looked like an elongated crowbar. Gripped by fear, I sprang into action and urged my friends to get into the RV and lock the doors. With hurried steps, Olivia hastily dialed 911 on her phone but quickly discovered that there was no cell reception in this remote part of the park. Shrouded in an ominous silence, we sat huddled in fear as we watched through the window blinds while the mysterious man drew closer. He staggered around our campsite probing through our belongings with his crowbar before shifting his attention towards the RV. His eyes seemed to meet mine with an unnerving intensity, as he stared directly at the window I was peeking through. Hearing the crowbar methodically scrape along the side of the vehicle sent shivers down my spine grim realization setting in that he might have some sinister intent. Unbeknownst to us, our fun-filled weekend in nature would descend into terror and chaos. Taking a deep breath, Bradley ex-military, tried his best to remain calm as he made a desperate yet futile attempt to attract help by blowing forcefully into an emergency whistle. In response, the sinister figure outside snickered maliciously before shattering one of the RV windows with his crowbar 
and sending sparks from the campfire scattering. T this isn't funny any more, man, said Ethan, trembling beside me. Why are these things always happening when we try to relax? We just wanted some peace and nature. The stranger completely ignored our pleas for mercy as he scribbled what appeared to be unintelligible symbols on the door using a can of spray paint. Time seemed to crawl by at a snail's pace as we awaited his next move. Though we managed to gather objects that could serve as makeshift weapons, none of us dared to face him alone. All we could do was helplessly watch him through broken windows and rapidly losing hope. The harrowing night continued with the unnerving stranger only growing bolder in his actions. It became increasingly apparent that this attacker had no qualms with subjecting us to fear for his amusement or some unfathomable end goal. Realizing that calling for help was our only chance of survival, we scanned our surroundings for a higher vantage point to improve cell reception. Noticing a hill nearby, I cautiously unlocked the RV door and made my decision. I need to get closer to that hill, I whispered, resolving to risk everything. I'll try to call for help while the rest of you stay here. Olivia nodded, handing me her phone. Be careful, she mouthed. Determined, I slipped out and sprinted towards the hill keeping my head low and praying the attacker would not notice me. As I reached the top of the incline, breathing heavily and clutching Olivia's phone in trembling hands, I finally managed to send a desperate call for help to the authorities. Relieved when they answered, I relayed our urgent need for assistance before racing back towards the RV. As I stealthily approached its side, my heart sank upon witnessing a horrifying scene. Our attacker had forced open one of the doors and begun dragging Bradley out by his leg while he valiantly struggled to break free. The assailant was a large man with unkempt hair, dressed in tattered clothing that barely covered his muscular frame. His eyes burned with malicious intent as he focused on his victim. Thinking quickly, I scooped up a rock from nearby and hurled it at the attacker's head, managing to momentarily disorient him long enough for Bradley to escape his grasp. The commotion drew attention from our friends inside the RV Ethan and Olivia rapidly opened another door and pulled Bradley back in while slamming it shut on their pursuer's arm. The man's muffled screams filled the air as we frantically drove off desperate to escape this unexpected nightmare. Despite sustaining some injuries during our struggle with the attacker, including scrapes, bruises, and cuts, we clung on to hope knowing that help would be on its way. Hours later, we spotted the distant flashing lights of police cars headed towards our campsite as we explained our harrowing experience to disbelieving officers over the phone. By the time the authorities arrived, however, all traces of the man who had relentlessly tormented us had vanished. All that remained were the chillingly cryptic symbols he had painted on our RV's door. The police advised us to leave the remote area immediately and escorted us out as officers began combing through the scene in search of any evidence. We were grateful to have been spared from any further harm but the secrets left behind by that terrifying individual lingered like a fading nightmare. The gruesome reminders of his attacks left deep emotional scars which would take years to heal for each and every one of us. As we drove away from the forest park, the recollections of our weekend took on a darker tone. Gone were the innocent days of laughter that preceded our desperate escape replaced by traumatic memories that would haunt us for the rest of our lives. They would serve as a grim reminder that even in moments meant for solace and joy, nightmares can find a way in. Though we left with our lives intact and had done everything in our power to help each other survive, we would never forget what was lost during that nightmare weekend. Unseen in the darkness of night, 
Bradley's shattered emergency whistle remained behind at the campsite, both a testament to our resilience under pressure and an unsettling reminder of what we had endured against a seemingly unstoppable attacker with inscrutable motives. One sloppy, humid afternoon in July 2019, I was struggling to put up our RV awning in a quiet campground located just outside the Grand Canyon in Arizona. If you think I hate camping you might be right, but my wife Karen had been adamant about experiencing nature by spending quality time outdoors with our two kids. And so, there we were. Hey Dad! Can I make a joke for you and Mom? Our eight-year-old daughter April asked as she tried to hammer ten stakes. Karen and I exchanged amused glances before nodding in agreement. Go on, sweetheart. Karen encouraged her. Knock, knock! April exclaimed. Karen and I grinned. Who's there? We asked in unison. April giggled before replying. Interrupting cow. Puzzled, we asked. Interrupting cow who? Moo. April managed to say before falling into fits of laughter. Karen and I couldn't help but laugh at our daughter's silly sense of humor. We spent the evening playing card games while roasting marshmallows over an open fire. As it grew darker and colder outside, we decided to call it a night. No sooner had we settled into our sleeping bags when an odd noise caught our attention. The sound of someone fumbling around outside our RV, chalking it up to a curious raccoon or an impatient camper exploring the grounds late at night. I tried to convince myself and my family that there was nothing unusual happening. As the strange noises persisted, my curiosity took hold. I couldn't just lie there oblivious to whatever was happening outside. Deciding that enough was enough, I told my wife that I'd carefully investigate the sound from one of the RV windows just to make sure everything was alright. I crept over to the window nearest the source of the noise while Karen and the kids huddled nervously by their sleeping bags. As I adjusted my eyes to the darkness outside, I spied a man wearing a tattered beige hoodie with filthy, disheveled hair. His gaunt, unshaven face was unfamiliar. Just then, our ten-year-old son Timmy let out a sudden shout of frustration. Why don't we have any cell service? The noise seemed to startle the intruder, who looked up from his eerie activity. His eyes met mine through the window. He stared at me intensely before displaying an unnerving grin that sent shivers down my spine. To our horror, he stalked over to our RV and started pounding violently on the door. My heart raced as I fumbled for something, anything, to defend my family from the impending threat. At this point, there was no way anyone was going to sleep. Karen held Timmy and April close as their innocent faces searched mine for an explanation. Still shocked, all I could manage was a shaky whisper. We've got to get out of here. Karen nodded as she tried to hold back her tears. She knew I was scared and seeing me like this undoubtedly frightened her just as much. On cue, our uninvited, guests suddenly stopped pounding on the door. The campground fell eerily quiet once again. Through the window's mesh screen, I caught sight of the man wielding what appeared to be a bloody hatchet in one hand and duct tape in the other. Having realized that he wasn't going anywhere anytime soon, I searched desperately for an escape plan, one that would lead us far away from this stranger and into safety without attracting attention. The tension was palpable as we listened intently for any hint of movement outside our RV, ready to make our escape at a moment's notice. From Karen's throat escaped the faintest of sobs, silent but heavy with fear, 
as we strained to hear whether madness or mercy awaited on the other side of our RV door. I knew we had to act fast if we wanted to leave this place alive, so I turned to Karen and said, We need to distract him somehow, and then flee through the back door. Karen nodded in agreement. I'll distract him by throwing one of our bags out the window, she whispered. She grabbed one of our smaller bags, thankfully filled with only unbreakable items, and hurled it in the opposite direction from where we planned to escape. The sound of the bag hitting the ground caught the attention of the man outside. He froze for a moment before turning his head to investigate the noise. Seizing the opportunity, I grabbed my family's hands and ushered them towards the back door as stealthily as possible. The four of us exited just as he was approaching the noise. Run! I shouted. The adrenaline coursed through our veins as we dashed through the dark campground, trying not to trip on unseen branches or rocks. As we fled from potential harm, it wasn't fear that prevented us from calling for help but the realization that we couldn't trust anyone else at that moment. There was simply no time to involve others when escaping was our only priority. Once we were a safe distance away, I decided it was time to get authorities involved. Using Karen's phone, which somehow still had signal, I dialed 911 and reported what happened at our campsite. Within minutes, law enforcement officers arrived on scene. They escorted us back to our campsite while describing their strategy to capture the man who had terrified us all. When we reached our RV, however, there was no sign of him he had vanished as if he was never there in the first place. In an attempt to identify him, officers questioned nearby campers and collected evidence from around our site including footprints and any other traces left behind by the unknown attacker. Meanwhile, my family stood together, trying not to dwell on what could have happened if the man had been able to reach us. Even though our safety was now ensured, we couldn't help but feel concerned for other unsuspecting campers who might cross paths with this deranged individual. Days passed and we did our best to continue enjoying our vacation while the police conducted their investigation. However, the incident left an impression not only on our present experience, but the way we view camping trips in the future. On the final day of our trip, we received a call from law enforcement, informing us that they had identified and apprehended the mysterious man who had attacked us. Relief washed over us as we heard the news not just for ourselves but for every camper who could have encountered him. His motives were unclear, but he seemed fueled by a deep psychosis and an unchecked desire for violence. I can't help but feel that if the circumstances had played out differently that night, there's no telling what he may have done to my family or other innocent people. As we packed up our belongings and prepared to leave the campground, I found myself reflecting on what we had been through. The ordeal reminded us of how fragile life can be and how something normal and routine can suddenly turn into a terrifying nightmare. Our escape taught us to never take safety for granted. While our lives would eventually return to normal, Memories of that harrowing night will undoubtedly haunt our family vacations for years to come. At the same time, those memories serve as a reminder of what may lurk in the darkness, and as motivation to always be vigilant in protecting ourselves and those we love most. It was just an ordinary afternoon in June 2018, when I finally took a break from a difficult week at work. My friends and I grabbed all the necessary gear and supplies for the long-awaited RV camping trip out in the Red River Gorge, a beautiful region in eastern Kentucky. It was my first time going there, 
but my buddy Mark had told me endless stories about how stunning and serene the place is, so it seemed like the perfect destination to unwind and recover from day-to-day -day life stresses. After we arrived at our campsite and parked our RV, Emily and Luke began setting up our camping chairs and preparing a bonfire for later that evening, while I pulled some specialty hot dogs I had brought from home out of the cooler to cook for dinner. I was cracking a joke about these hot dogs containing some pretty peculiar ingredients as we got started on our meal preparation. The first couple of days were wonderful. We went hiking through the lush forest trails, climbing some of the cliffs and taking in breathtaking views we'll never forget. The tranquility of nature infused our minds with pure peace and joy. However, late into the third day, Emily brought something unusual to our attention. She pointed out that a strange man had been standing at the edge of our campsite earlier that morning. Looking uncomfortable at this observation, Luke mentioned that he too had noticed someone briefly watching us from afar when we returned from our hike yesterday evening as well. Feeling intrigued by these accounts which seemed to potentially corroborate one another, Mark suggested that perhaps this person got lost or needed help but was too shy or scared to approach us directly. We laughed off any remaining concerns in a poor attempt to dismiss them as frivolous paranoia. That night, unable to sleep due to lingering anxieties, I stepped outside the RV around 1 a.m. under moonlit skies. What I saw still haunts me today. There stood a tall, unkempt man of terrifying appearance. His greasy dark hair was matted and hung down past his shoulders. His black eyes emanated an expression of cold menace as they locked onto mine making my blood run cold. He wore tattered clothes that were barely held together and covered in what looked like dried blood stains. As he slowly began advancing toward me, I felt my heart pounding uncontrollably in my chest, and I considered fleeing back into the RV. At that moment, Luke emerged from behind me, armed with a baseball bat and loudly demanded that the stranger identify himself. Mark dashed to call for help on his cell phone but realized he had no reception in this remote area. In dire desperation, he tried activating his satellite phone to send out a distress signal. Our sense of dread was intensified by the stranger's silence as he continued advancing. The bonfire had dwindled down into embers emitting a faint glow, and I could see Mark shouting at him to stay back with increased fervor. But the stranger seemed unresponsive. He didn't flinch or acknowledge our attempts to intimidate him in any way. Luke swung the baseball bat in an attempt to further persuade the man away from our camp but missed due to the growing distance between them. As Mark's arm rose up high again with bat clenched in his fist, Preparing for a swing more powerful than before, we then noticed another figure emerging from behind the menacing intruder amidst the shadows cast by the trees almost as if it were silently materializing out of thin air. The second figure emerged from the shadows, revealing a woman who was equally disheveled and frightening as the unkempt man. They both showed no sign of acknowledging our attempts to force them away and their continued eerie silence only added to the intensity of the situation. As the two figures drew closer to our camp, I noticed that they were limping and seemed to be in pain, yet their determination to reach us remained strong. My instincts told me that there was something terribly wrong going on, and without any means of communication with the outside world, we couldn't rely on any help arriving. Luke, Sensing my growing panic, tried shouting once more at the strangers to leave. Again, his efforts went ignored. Having seen enough, he swung his bat once more at the approaching man, connecting this time with a sickening crunch. The man fell to the ground but quickly rose back, unfazed by the attack. 
Seeing that physical force wasn't stopping these intruders, Mark came up with another plan. He dashed into the RV and returned with a flare gun in hand. We all watched in fear as he pointed it directly at the advancing woman and fired. The flare struck her squarely in the chest and exploded violently. The woman let out an ear-piercing shriek as she was set ablaze. Much to our horror, though, even being consumed by flames did not appear to deter her. She continued lurching forward until she finally collapsed. The sight of his companion aflame must have enraged the man because he began lunging towards us even more aggressively despite suffering an earlier blow from Luke's bat. With no other choice but to defend ourselves once again in hopes of stopping him, we threw everything at him, rocks, sticks, anything we could get our hands on. Despite our relentless barrage against him, he kept coming towards us with fierce determination. It was apparent that ordinary means would not suffice against the intruders. As he lunged at me in a desperate attempt to finally capture one of us, Luke managed to tackle him from the side, sending both of them tumbling to the ground. I raced to help Luke, who held the man down. Mark searched frantically for something to bind the man and found a roll of duct tape inside the RV. With considerable effort, we restrained the somewhat subdued man, still curious about how he could endure so much abuse with little reaction. Having no means of calling for help or any explanation as to what had transpired that night, we decided to hightail it out of there before any other bizarre events occurred. Driving through the night, we finally reached an area with cell phone reception and alerted the authorities. We recounted our harrowing encounter and handed over the bound man with no small trepidation. The events that took place during our camping trip will forever remain etched in our minds. The reason behind those unsettling strangers or their determination to impose harm upon us never came to light despite thorough investigations by the police. Our lives inevitably returned to normal, but not without a lingering sense of paranoia and unease about what else could lurk in the wilderness. There are times when we look back on that trip and think about the woman engulfed in flames, her shrieks still echoing in our ears and causing chills down our spines. At times like these, we can only hope that when faced with unknown circumstances and danger, strength and unity will prevail in helping us survive encounters with the unexplained horrors lurking in this world. It was late June 2021, and the hot, sticky air clung to my skin as I set up camp in the Shenandoah National Park in Virginia. My friend, Nolan Grayson, and I had taken off work to enjoy a week of peace and quiet in our rented RV, armed with cold beers and enough food to cook up a feast every night. An escape from reality was long overdue for both of us. We took the first day to explore the park leisurely, admiring the lush greenery and the wildlife we rarely saw in the bustling city we called home a welcome change from our monotonous lives. As we made our way through a trail on the second day, Nolan complained that his feet were sore but decided to trudge on in search of a serene spot for us to rest. He chuckled and said, You know what they say about people with big feet, right? Remembering an old joke about the connection between big feet and absurd clumsiness, I burst out laughing. Right. They always trip over nothing. When we eventually found a beautiful clearing near a babbling brook, Nolan immediately kicked off his shoes and dipped his tired feet into the cool water. The world truly seemed perfect at that moment. Over the next few days, we had fallen into an easy rhythm, wake up late to enjoy hot coffee outside, hike nearby trails during the afternoons, 
and unwind with laughter under a blanket of stars in the evenings. We couldn't have asked for a better trip so far. We were enjoying dinner at our campsite when we heard rustling near our RV. Before either of us could react or think it was something dangerous like a wild bear or mountain lion not realizing how unlikely that would be an unfamiliar figure stepped out of the trees with blood-splattered clothing. His piercing eyes locked onto us as his disheveled hair and dirt-strewn face further added to the sense of fear that slowly crept up on us. The man seemed to ignore our shocked reactions, steadily approaching and muttering something under his breath that was barely audible. Nolan and I exchanged panicked glances, frantically thinking about what to do in this surreal and unmistakably unsettling situation. My adrenaline was starting to pump, but it felt like my body had been glued to the ground, unable to move. Abruptly, the man started screaming incoherently and waving around a knife while watching Nolan and me like a predator stalking its prey. That was what it took to break us out of our stunned state. We scrambled towards our RV in an attempt to lock ourselves in but the stranger rushed forward with an undeniable determination that struck terror into our hearts. Realizing that locking ourselves in wasn't going to be possible with the maniac racing after us, we changed course and raced into the woods. I knew that park rangers made routine patrols nearby. As we ran, Nolan tried turning on the walkie-talkie we had with us for emergencies but there were no replies from the other end. We darted through trees and over rocks with the man still in hot pursuit. His gory appearance and violent fixation on harming us filled my thoughts what had driven him down this path of insanity. As we ran, I spotted a small cave off to the side, and I quickly grabbed Nolan's arm to redirect our course. We entered the cave, hearing the man's screams and the sound of his heavy breathing echoing behind us. It seemed like he was getting closer. In an act of desperation, I decided that calling for help was necessary despite fearing for our safety if other people were dragged into this madness. I pulled out my phone and dialed 911, trying to keep my voice as steady as possible as I explained the situation to the operator. Before I could finish explaining, I heard a scream from the man that sounded far too close for comfort. We quickly hung up the phone and tried to go further in. Perhaps there was another exit we could take advantage of. As we moved deeper into the cave, we could see traces of blood smeared across the uneven walls which only fueled our desire to escape. Ahead of us, we noticed some sunlight filtering through a small opening leading outside. We crawled through it as fast as possible, our hearts pounding with fear. The woods extended before us, providing an opportunity to lose ourselves in the dense foliage. We continued running until it felt like our lungs would give out, but at last, we found a road nearby. Without slowing down we managed to flag down a passing truck and jump inside. The driver accelerated away from that nightmare, providing us with temporary relief from our impending doom. As we began to gain some distance between us and the deranged man, we recounted our story once again to the truck driver who listened with horror and empathy. However, fate was not kind to us that day. Just as we started feeling safe again, we saw in horror how that same blood-splattered figure emerged from behind a tree only meters from our earlier path. He stared straight at us before starting his relentless chase anew while swinging his knife menacingly. Nolan and I exchanged panicked glances once more, realizing that there was no time to lose. He held up his phone and started recording the man in pursuit capturing his twisted snarl and threatening gore-streaked appearance. The driver called the authorities who quickly approached our location with sirens blaring. The man stopped abruptly in his tracks, 
It seemed like the first time he had noticed the sirens. The police cars swarmed around him, trapping him in place, but his expression remained defiant and menacing, even while faced with capture. As officers cautiously approached him, he let out one last deafening scream before lunging at one of the officers with his knife. It was a gruesome sight, but desperation calls for desperate action another officer shot him, incapacitating him without causing fatal injury. Paramedics arrived on the scene to treat both the injured officer and the deranged man. As they immobilized him on a stretcher, we were filled with an uneasy feeling that perhaps this nightmare might be over soon. Following the incident, a thorough investigation revealed that our attacker had been a notorious criminal who escaped from a psychiatric facility shortly before we encountered him. He had been involved in several acts of violence which left numerous victims in his wake. Nolan and I decided to end our trip early and return home to recover from those terrifying few days. We sent our gratitude to the police officers who ensured our safety and wished for the injured officer's full recovery. With time, we began to heal from the ordeal. But every now and then, as darkness falls while camping under a starlit sky or hiking through secluded woods, the terrifying memories of that man's gaze come back to haunt us. It all started about six years ago when I decided to take a break from my mundane nine-to-five job and treat myself to a well-deserved vacation. I had always been captivated by tales of picturesque landscapes, natural beauty, and scenic destinations in the heart of Colorado. So, without further ado, I planned a solo camping trip into the great outdoors in my trusty RV. It was June 2016 when I set off on this journey, traveling through miles of lush forests and breathtaking mountain ranges. I couldn't be happier enjoying the cool breeze against my face and watching the seemingly endless stretch of greenery unfold before me. As the sun lowered its gaze upon the horizon, I found myself a secluded spot along a winding river to park my RV for the night. As I settled in, I decided to call my wife, Jessamine Barnett. She was thrilled to hear about my adventures so far. After catching up on our usual banter and some laughter over potato chips, we hung up promising to talk again soon. The next day greeted me with golden rays of sunshine, while birds melodiously chirped in perfect harmony. All was well until about midday when I stumbled upon an abandoned campsite not too far from where my RV was parked. As I cautiously approached the site, an overpowering stench caught me off guard. Rancid food and decaying remains of personal belongings were strewn about haphazardly. The scene sent shivers down my spine as something felt truly wrong. Ignoring that gnawing feeling in the pit of my stomach, I snapped some photos intending to show them to authorities later on and hastily returned to my RV. Little did I know that this seemingly innocent encounter would spiral me into depths that words could barely describe. That night as dusk fell upon the valley, an air of unease hung heavily around me like a shroud. My instincts told me it was about time to pack up and leave, but a part of me still resisted that urge, wanting to stay just another day. As I contemplated my next move, a faint rustling sound resonated from the nearby bushes, subtly cracking branches following suit. A figure emerged from the darkness, shrouded in shadows but noticeable enough to sense its sinister aura. The man was exceptionally tall and imposing, with broad shoulders that cast a chilling silhouette against the moonlit sky. His face remained hidden beneath a hood, and in his hand gleamed an unmistakable glint of steel, a weapon of some sort. 
Fears surged through my veins as I watched him stealthily approach the abandoned campsite I had discovered earlier. My heart pounded mercilessly against my chest. Beads of sweat formed upon my furrowed brow. I had no choice but to helplessly watch from where I stood. As he reached the campsite, the man began rummaging through tents and belongings with unwarranted malice. With each violent rip and shred echoing across the valley, it didn't take long for me to realize that he was searching for something, or someone. My heart raced as I stood there paralyzed with fear. If I made any noise or movement, he might notice me and I did not want to risk the confrontation. His search seemed to intensify in its maliciousness. Clearly, he was growing more desperate and frustrated. I knew the best thing to do was to call for help, but how could I do so without alerting the man to my presence? My cell phone was inside the RV, and my hands were shaking so much I doubted I could dial without making a sound. The thought of drawing attention to myself was too terrifying. It seemed all I could do was watch from afar and hope he didn't find what he was looking for. As luck would have it, a group of hikers arrived at the campsite and almost immediately noticed the hooded figure. They shouted at him, asking who he was and what he was doing. Startled by their arrival, the man straightened up, his hand gripping the weapon tightly. The leader of the group, an athletic woman with red hair pulled back into a ponytail, took a step forward in an attempt to intimidate him. I think you need to leave this area, she said firmly. Instead of leaving, however, the man raised his weapon, a long knife, and lunged toward her. The hiker screamed in terror as the blade met its mark with a sickening sound. Blood splattered on the ground as the woman's lifeless body crumbled to the earth. Horrified expressions crossed their faces as they turned to flee. But they didn't get far. With lightning speed, the hooded man chased them down one by one, slashing at them mercilessly until their screams ceased echoing throughout the valley. Witnessing these gruesome attacks sent me into a frantic frenzy as thoughts of survival overtook my consciousness. Taking advantage of this brief distraction that completely focused on his rampage, I sprinted back to my RV the screams of dying hikers creating a cacophony of fear as my body and nerves revolted against the decisions my mind was still wrestling with. Barely making it inside, I fumbled for my phone, and as I heard the screams die down outside, I quickly dialed the police. Within minutes of explaining the situation in hushed whispers, sirens pierced the valley, sending me a small sense of relief. But it was short-lived. As the police arrived on the scene, they were met with a grisly sight. The carnage of dismembered bodies littered across the bloody campsite. Officers armed with guns swarmed the area in search of the hooded figure, but to no avail. It seemed as if he had slipped away, becoming one with the darkness that engulfed the valley once more. Despite their best efforts and numerous searches over several days, he was never found. The tragedy at the campsite weighed heavily upon us for weeks afterward. The memories of those innocent hikers haunted me day and night, their terrified expressions forever etched into my mind. The events served as an everlasting reminder that in this world lurk dangerous individuals who relished inflicting pain on others. But from that harrowing experience also emerged newfound strength within me. There came a fundamental understanding that I am not powerless against such evil in the world, that when life confronts terrifying circumstances, I must find a way to take control and make every effort to survive, even if it means pushing past paralyzing fear. The valley may have borne witness to one horrendous night of slaughter at the hands of a mysterious figure we still have no answers for. 
but it also marked my journey from a passive observer to someone willing to take action in critical moments when there is no other choice, when what seems like an endless nightmare only ends through our own actions. It was a typical Wednesday afternoon in August 2009, and my best friend Tom and I were packing up our RV for a well-deserved vacation. Our destination, Flathead Lake, Montana, a beautiful and serene spot we had been wanting to explore for years. Our journey began early the next day as we set out towards the lake. Upon arrival, we quickly found an excellent spot at the edge of the water where we could park our RV. From here, we were able to gaze at the tranquil body of water surrounded by tall pines, setting the perfect stage for an unforgettable experience. While setting up camp, we were joined by our other friends Johan and Maria, who decided to drive down from their home in Idaho Falls to join us. We couldn't believe how fortunate we were as four close friends away on vacation with excellent weather, stunning scenery, and an ideal company. One evening as Johan prepared dinner on a portable grill, Maria took out her book and began reading aloud a news story about recent break-ins at homes in a nearby community. Apparently, it was believed that one man was responsible for all of them but had yet to be identified. This news put us all slightly on edge but didn't dampen our spirits too much. It wasn't until three days into our trip that everything changed. While sitting around our campfire sharing stories from past road trips and travels, I felt a sudden urge to use the restroom accumulating from all the hot dogs and potato salad consumed earlier that day. I grabbed my flashlight and ventured towards the public restroom facilities near our camping spot. While walking under the starry night sky along the path leading me to my destination, I caught a sudden jolt of icy feeling against my back. At first glance around not understanding what could have caused the sensation outside of my swollen bladder. Soon after recovering from that split second, it wasn't long before I saw him, a man dressed in ragged clothes, with unkempt hair and an unkempt beard to match. He stood close enough so that I could describe him to a T but far enough to make me question whether my eyes were playing tricks on me. Although he resembled an ordinary human being, his eyes pierced into mine with a sense of malice that penetrated my soul. It suddenly clicked. This unknown man could very well be the same person responsible for the break-ins back at the nearby town. Fear gripped me like a python squeezing the life out of its prey as I immediately turned back and sprinted towards our campsite breathlessly whispering Maria's name. My friends quickly sensed my distress and huddled around me. Between gasps for air, I managed to tell them about my encounter with the strange man. Tom fired up his lantern, intending to do anything from scaring him off or cornering him if given the chance. We couldn't take any risk. Before long, we decided we had to let someone know if not at least find another area in which we all approved. We couldn't sit idly by after witnessing this ominous figure lurking near our campgrounds. With every step towards the park ranger's office, we all tensely looked around, expecting this mysterious intruder to emerge from the shadows suddenly. It's like he vanished into thin air, Johan muttered, only fueling our anxiety more. Finally arriving at our destination, we frantically pressed the buzzer situated outside on the small porch as what seemed a lengthy wait before hearing someone answer. As the park ranger began to pull open the door, there was no preparing for what happened next. Bullets streaked through the early morning air as a sharp pain pierced along my arm. Staggering backward, we saw him, 
the same disturbing figure intensely firing shots while moving chaotically towards us in an unpredictable manner. All hell had broken loose, and our once serene vacation had spiraled into a nightmarish situation. Everyone's panic screams were deafening, and our environment was a typhoon of utter chaos. We had to act fast. Run inside! I yelled, as we scrambled through the open door of the park ranger's office, escaping the gunfire. The ranger, seemingly in shock, managed to follow suit and lock the door behind us. Our unknown assailant continued firing maddeningly at the windows and walls, but it was clear that he had no intention of leaving. Tom quickly rounded up any makeshift weapons we could find in the room, a knife, a baton, and other tools we hoped would be enough to defend ourselves. Maria dialed 911, informing the operator of our dire situation. However, they stated that help was at least 30 minutes away, time we feared we didn't have. I glanced around the office for any other possible escape routes or ways to keep the attacker at bay. We found a back door and decided that while far from ideal, it was our best option for fleeing. We nervously lined up by the door, holding our breath as we prepared to charge out. With a quick nod of agreement and a final deep breath, we burst through the door with astonishing speed as adrenaline rushed through our veins. Meanwhile, Johan remained behind at the window to observe and report on any changes or developments. Minutes later, as fire pierced my lungs from continuous running, I looked back for any sight of our pursuer. Miraculously, he did not follow us past the confines of the park ranger's office. The sound of sirens pierced our awareness moments later. It seemed that help had arrived sooner than anticipated. We were flooded with relief but remained cautious as multiple squads surrounded the area. After what felt like hours spent answering questions and giving statements to police officers, they informed us that they had caught a man matching our description. His motives remained unclear but his criminal record painted an unsettling picture, previous convictions for assault and stalking. The police provided transportation back to town for my friends and me, while the captured man was taken into custody. It was surreal how swiftly it all unfolded, but the haunting memories of that night lingered far longer. In the end, we offered our heartfelt appreciation and gratitude to the police officers who worked tirelessly to resolve the matter quickly and efficiently. Recovery took time, enduring sleepless nights filled with vivid scenes from our camping trip gone awry. But amidst the raw and painful memories, resilience and friendship endured. Surviving this traumatic encounter brought us closer together as friends, sharing strength and comfort through mutual support. While we may never truly understand or forget what transpired during that harrowing experience, we learned that sticking together could help us face even the most horrific challenges. It was the weekend of the 4th of July a few years ago when the incident occurred, and I had decided to celebrate by treating myself to some much-needed alone time. As was my custom, I packed my trusty RV with all the necessary supplies and began my journey to Sequoia National Park. Upon arriving at the park, I was elated to discover that my preferred campsite was vacant a secluded area nestled among colossal trees that helped me feel connected to nature. As I pulled in and started setting up camp, a sense of peace washed over me. As daylight turned to dusk, I found myself chuckling over a cheesy joke featured on an off-brand popsicle stick from my newly stocked RV freezer. I began reminiscing about past camping trips, the memories flooding in like old friends. 
A menacing crash from somewhere nearby shattered my serenity. Startled but rationalizing that it was likely just a deer or another camper venturing too far from their intended path, I shrugged off my uneasiness and continued my evening rituals. The next day, inexplicably, other campers began discussing a mysterious man who had been spotted throughout the park the previous day. According to their detailed accounts, the individual bore a heavily scarred face riddled with mismatched tattoos. The descriptions were so vivid that it almost seemed as if they were talking about someone from one of those true crime TV shows. Meanwhile, more strange occurrences transpired throughout the park. Missing personal items and juvenile pranks no one could quite trace back to their perpetrator. At this point, concern began simmering within me, but still feeling silly admitting so publicly. I am known for being rather skeptical of outrageous tales, so instead I hiked on. On day three, after enjoying an evening by the campfire sharing s mores with neighboring campers, a recipe from their German grandma that left us all fighting over who got the last batch, I decided to turn in for the night. While I had become wary of the unsettling happenings in and around our once tranquil camping grounds, we reassured each other by jokingly blaming unruly squirrels for our troubles. I settled into my RV, double-checked the locks on the doors, and fixated on calming ambient noise a comforting reminder of the beauty that still surrounded me. Somehow sleep found me amidst my heightened senses. Hours later, I was jolted awake by banging in the distance. My heart raced as I listened closely for any signs of activity outside of my RV. The slow creaking of metal rang out and intensified into an excruciating crescendo. Fear pulsed through me as I realized silence had fallen and been replaced with heavy breathing emanating just outside my door. My mind screamed in panic, thinking only of the mysterious man who had consumed campfire chatter in recent days. No! It can't be! I whispered to myself, fighting back tears while clutching the sharpest knife I could find in my makeshift kitchen. The door handle jiggled and my worst nightmare materialized before me, the scarred and tattooed face peering through a crack in the door. Adrenaline surged through every vein as my RV rocked frantically from his relentless attack, with his piercing eyes and crooked smile promising pain. In the split second of panic, I knew I couldn't fight this man. He was much stronger and more dangerous than I am. So, without any hesitation, I did what seemed to be my only option. I yelled for help as loudly as possible. My voice echoed through the night air, desperately hoping to reach the ears of my fellow campers. As if on cue, a flashlight's beam cut through the darkness and landed on the intruder. Startled by the sudden burst of light, he stopped his assault for a moment giving me the opportunity to push him back and slam the door shut. My hands trembled as I locked it again. My heart pounded in my chest like a drum. While my mind raced with fear, another camper, one of those who shared s mores with me earlier, had heard my screams and rushed to my aid. Together, we pressed our weight against the door keeping it closed in case the man tried to force his way in once more. The heavy breathing outside ceased as we could hear footsteps retreating from my RV into the darkness. We remained still for what felt like an eternity before plucking up the courage to check whether he was really gone or just hiding somewhere close by. Other campers had gathered nearest RV, holding flashlights and makeshift weapons while chatting in frantic whispers. Their faces showed concern and anxiety, all except one man who remained eerily calm throughout this ordeal. With tentative steps, we ventured out of the safety of my RV and quickly shared what had happened with everyone present. 
The cop man took control of the situation. He suggested we all return to our own campsites, securing them as best as possible and remaining vigilant. He turned to me specifically and said that it would be safer if I stayed with someone else during the rest of our camping trip. So together with another camper's family who had assisted me earlier, we built a temporary haven from this nightmarish experience. We didn't sleep a wink for the rest of that night. Days passed, and news of the unsettling events spread through the park like wildfire. Park rangers organized a search party for the man, hoping to apprehend him before he could cause harm again. Yet, no one could locate him, not even with their knowledge of every nook and cranny of the park. On the last day of the trip, as we were packing up to leave this place behind, tainted by fear and memories of our close encounters, I felt a mix of relief and sadness. Relief because we were finally leaving this nightmare behind us. Sadness because camping trips would never feel like they used to again. As we said our goodbyes to newfound friends, with hopeful plans to reunite under better circumstances, the calm man approached me one last time. He shook my hand firmly, nodding his head as if he was proud that we had managed to get away. We left the park with apprehension still lingering in our minds. Looking back now, I take solace in knowing that, at least for a few days, we came together in unity despite facing an indescribable fear. The memories of those who endured this experience with me will forever remain ingrained both within mind and heart. We endured an unknown terror together and emerged stronger from it. Even though we won't forget the gruesome facial features and terrifying motivations of that disturbed antagonist in our lives, I can say with certainty, we won't let him dictate how we live or tarnish future camping trips joy ever again. It was around 10 a.m. on a casual June morning in 2017, and I had just fired up the grill to cook breakfast next to our rented RV. One of our group's annual camping trips typically consisted of friends cracking jokes and inhaling enough bug spray to make us cough. Hey, Josh! Did you see that squirrel try to dive headfirst into Jacob's backpack? Chuckled my friend, Karen. Seriously? It probably smelled the fruity nonsense he uses as cologne. I replied with a grin. We were camping in the serene Sycamore Grove Park in Livermore, California, where the rustling trees and quiet surroundings helped us escape from routine's humdrum. Our group had been there for two days already, merely enjoying nature and each other's company. As we sat down around the picnic table, Karen brought up something that instantly changed the atmosphere. I read online about some creepy stories about this park. Apparently, a mysterious man has been seen wandering deeper into the woods. No way, said David defensively. I don't believe it. Feeling stubbornly skeptical but amused by our group's sudden change of demeanor, we continued with our relaxing day outdoors. The topic remained unresolved but lost in favor of a game of touch football. Later that evening, as we sat huddled around the campfire exchanging more ghost stories and singing songs, I noticed movement at the edge of the firelit area. Squinting my eyes to adjust to the darkness beyond our campfire ring, my heart began pounding rapidly when I recognized it wasn't just my imagination. A tall man stood just beyond flickering shadows cast by our roaring flames. He had wild black hair streaked with red and a pale face covered in dirt and dark markings. He wore tattered clothing that looked as if they hadn't been touched by water or soap for ages his grotesque appearance was enough to send shivers down my spine. I quickly alerted the rest of our group, 
But as we all turned to look, the man disappeared into the darkness of the wooded area. Tensions were now running on high. It was impossible for us to shake the image of the gruesome man lurking beyond our campsite. We anxiously wondered if this was connected to Karen's story or if it was just some vagrant passing through. Attempting to relieve some tension, I cracked a joke. Maybe half red hair crept in for a midnight snack? We didn't even invite him for S. Mores, so it serves us right. Everyone gave out a nervous chuckle, but it was clear that no one was comfortable staying at that campsite anymore. After a few rushed suggestions made in hushed tones, we decided to switch locations. The move would cost us time and energy. However, we were unable to justify staying at our current site after witnessing such a disturbing figure. We hurriedly packed our belongings and moved deeper into the park where we hoped we wouldn't run into any other visitors particularly not those of the skin-crawling variety. Once we found a new spot and settled down, our group discussed the possibility that we had just encountered the same mysterious man Karen mentioned. Despite feeling on edge, there was no sign of danger around our new location. Four hours afterward, Conversations among friends and quiet rustlings of nature filled the night air like an orchestra. Gradually, our confidence began to rebuild as it seemed less likely that we'd face whatever unsettling figure awaited us back at our former campsite. Unexpectedly and unfortunately, our peace shattered with an agonizing scream in the distance. Crawling into panic mode once again and certain that it must be related to the creepy man from earlier, we grasped makeshift weapons including large branches and rods from disassembled tents as we cautiously headed in the direction of the blood-curdling cry. I really hope this is just some hiker messing around, and we don't find anything horrific. Karen muttered with furrowed brows. The night grew increasingly darker as we ventured further from our campsite. Our flashlights illuminated wide, frantic eyes as we tried to understand what could have caused such a petrifying scream. Suddenly, another scream echoed through the woods, this time much closer than before. Gripping my branch tighter, I could feel my whole body trembling from an adrenaline surge as we took off towards the source anxiety and terror clawing at my throat. As we continued towards the source of the screams, our tightly knit group moved cautiously through the dense forest. Each step became increasingly more difficult, with our legs feeling heavier from fear and fatigue. Finally, we reached a small clearing and were met with a horrifying sight, a terrified hiker covered in blood and gasping for air. The hiker seemed to have suffered an attack, but the assailant was nowhere in sight. We immediately realized that this was no prank something was terribly wrong in these woods. Stay here. I'll call for help, said Karen, her voice wavering as she pulled out her phone to dial the emergency services. We all agreed that this was the best course of action and silence followed as we waited anxiously for help to arrive. Minutes felt like hours, as we stood guard over the injured hiker and kept a watchful eye on our surroundings. Eventually, we heard rustling from the direction where we had first discovered the gruesome scene. Everyone prepared their makeshift weapons and braced for an encounter. To our horror, a tall man with half-red hair emerged from the darkness his skin unnaturally pale and his eyes void of any emotion. Wearing torn clothing and carrying a bloodied knife, it became obvious that he was responsible for both the injured hiker and the bone-chilling scream. He walked towards us with purposeful strides, clearly unhinged but undeniably human. It became more evident that this attacker was not some supernatural being but rather a deranged individual who found pleasure in terrorizing unsuspecting campers. While our heart rates increased exponentially, 
We knew we had to defend ourselves against this psychopath. Everyone surround him! Don't let him escape! shouted Karen as she directed us into position. Prepared for confrontation with our makeshift weapons raised high, adrenaline coursed through our veins. The half-red-haired man kept moving forward but made no attempt to communicate or explain his actions. As he reached us, he lunged at one of our friends with his bloody knife. We all attacked in response, striking the man with branches and rods in hopes of incapacitating him. In the midst of this chaotic confrontation, we noticed the distant sound of sirens growing more prominent. This was our chance to subdue the attacker long enough for help to arrive. Although exhausted and terrified, our combined efforts seemed to make a difference as the police arrived. The officers quickly took control of the situation, restraining this remorseless half-red-haired man and administering first aid to the injured hiker. The night was filled with relief and sorrow as we learned that this twisted individual had inflicted harm on other campers before crossing paths with our group. Fear had gripped us all throughout that night, but finally, a sense of closure came upon us knowing that he would not terrorize anyone else again. In the aftermath of this harrowing experience, we stood united in grief for those who didn't manage to escape his madness. Our camping trip started as an escape from reality but ended with a stark reminder of the cruelty that exists within humanity. Driven by fear and panic, we had managed to fight back against an antagonist who wished nothing more than to inflict pain on innocent campers. With hearts heavy from the reality we had faced together, we returned home changed by the events that transpired. The haunting memories of what happened in those woods would forever be etched in our minds a brutal reminder of how life could morph into a terrifying struggle for survival within mere moments. One exceptionally humid August in 2007, I found myself standing outside of a tiny RV that had become my home away from home. Just a regular guy, trying to escape the mundane life back in town and get some peace and quiet amid nature. I was no stranger to camping trips, but this location, Washburn County in Wisconsin, was entirely new to me. It resonated with a serenity that could only be truly appreciated in person. I'd been planning this solo camping trip for months. I didn't want to encounter any trouble or engage in wild adventures. All I needed was some relaxation and self-reflection. Little did I know, these aspirations would become mere distant dreams as the trip unfurled. Dusk had slipped into night and the fire outside my RV crackled merrily while the scent of roasting marshmallows filled the air. The sky was an open canopy of starry jewels, providing a view way more enchanting than anything back home. Why did the chicken cross the road? To get to the other side. I chuckled at my own poor attempt at lightening up the mood. Nights like these usually soothed me, undercut by friendly whispers among pine needles and reassuring calls of nocturnal critter kind. But tonight felt different. Silence hung heavy like dead air inside a closed garage. Suddenly, I heard distant rustling which grew increasingly louder. Branches cracked, and leaves crunched under the weight of someone, or something, creeping closer towards me. With my heart pounding in my ears, I grabbed a flashlight and scanned the area. A man emerged from behind a tree not far from where I stood, frozen in terror. His face was partially obscured by unkempt hair as wild as his eyes tunneling down into mine, drilling with ferocity that could cut through concrete. He wore tattered clothes encrusted with dirt and dried blood a grotesque shadow of a human being. 
His lips curled into a twisted smirk as an overwhelming stench, shaped by decay, rolled over me like a wave. Unarmed and afraid, I seized the opportunity to unleash my secret weapon. Did you hear about the claustrophobic astronaut? Apparently, he needed more space. To my horror, the man seemed unresponsive to my subpar joke. With that fleeting ember of hope extinguished, I tried to retreat into the nearby woods, hoping that my desperate charge would spur him into cowardly retreat or throw open at least one avenue for escape. Instead, he lunged forward with an uncanny swiftness that was unnatural to any person I had ever encountered. In what felt like slow motion, I managed to avoid his outstretched arms once and then again. I mindlessly sprinted towards a small clearing in the trees, too focused on survival to think about where I was heading. As I stumbled blindly deeper into the woods, the thought of asking for help from nearby campers crossed my mind. However, that would mean putting their lives at risk too. I couldn't bear the thought of becoming responsible for someone else's suffering. My legs felt like jelly as each step shook me vigorously from head to toe. I pushed myself past exhaustion, adrenaline coursed through my veins like hot lava urging me onward. The man trailed me like a deranged animal bloodthirsty predator relentlessly pursuing its prey. His wild hair danced in step with every stride while his once detached eyes glued themselves on me hungrily. No words passed between us as we entered into this chaotic whirlwind dance of terror, yet the gruesome grin adorning his face told me enough. My breath grew ragged, threatening to betray my anguished body and leave it vulnerable to defeat. With each worn-out step, all lingering hope that tonight's events were nothing more than an acute bout of campfire-inspired paranoia collapsed in on itself. I just needed a little peace and quiet was that too much to ask. Suddenly, I felt my foot snag on a protruding root. My fate was sealed in that pivotal moment, and the weight of my body sent me hurtling towards the earth with alarming acceleration. My hands reached out in desperation, clawing at wet soil as reality swarmed around me like a tide of abysmal despair. The man quickly closed the gap between us, the twisted smirk now plastered permanently onto his disfigured face. As I lay there, sprawled in the mud, I could hear the man's heavy breathing closing in on me. There was no time left for regret or tears. With every ounce of strength left in my body, I kicked backward into his stomach, not in an attempt to fight him off but to buy myself a few more seconds. He grunted in pain and stumbled backward, his grip momentarily broken. I scrambled to my feet and bolted deeper into the forest. My only advantage was knowing the terrain better than he did, due to spending countless hours exploring the woods during my camping trips. My chest heaved with every breath as sweat poured down my face. I had to think of a plan, something to stop him, or at least slow him down. My mind raced through different scenarios, finding a weapon, setting a trap, but none seemed plausible given my limited resources. And then it hit me, if I couldn't stop him directly, maybe I could get help from others without putting them at risk. Desperate and running out of options, I made my choice. I cupped my hands around my mouth and screamed at the top of my lungs for help. The sound pierced through the night sky. Surely it would reach any nearby campers or hikers who might be within earshot. The man's footsteps grew louder and closer. His infuriating grin now seemed even more grotesque amidst the darkness of the forest. Although calling for help put others at risk, it might have been my only chance at survival. As we darted through the underbrush, several distant shouts answered my call for help. Cries filled with confusion and concern echoed throughout the woods. 
the man's pursuit briefly faltered. Perhaps he wasn't so keen on targeting multiple victims after all. My legs burned with fatigue as we broke into another small clearing. This one spread before us like nature's trap of tangled dead trees and thickets. The perfect terrain to end this chase once and for all. Several beams of light pierced through the tree line. Help had arrived. Flashlights flickered as people, roused from their slumber, ventured out of their tents in search of the source of my scream. As the man took one final step towards me, a thunderous crack resonated through the forest, a deep and powerful gunshot. The man staggered, his eyes wide with surprise. Blood poured from the wound in his chest, soaking his filthy clothes. He crumbled to the ground with a sickening thud as several campers stepped into the clearing, some armed with rifles, others holding various camping tools. Their shared shock at witnessing this gruesome sight united them in a collective wave of horror. The man's twisted grin had faded, replaced by a cold and empty stare. He was dead, and I was alive, saved by strangers who'd come together in response to my desperate cry for help. As everyone stood there, staring at the lifeless body before us, I forced myself to breathe deeply, grateful for each precious gasp of air. I thanked them profusely for their bravery, knowing fully well that I wouldn't be standing there if it hadn't been for their selfless intervention. In the days that followed, we gathered together and reminisced about those lost to this deranged man's violence. We honored their memories and vowed never to forget each one of them. My life would never be the same after that night. I carried on knowing how fragile it is and how easily it can slip away. But amid all the fear and sorrow, there remained gratitude for those who came to my aid when I needed it most forever etching into my heart that even in our darkest moments, hope can still prevail. It was the kind of evening when you can't help but feel grateful for the air conditioning in your RV. The heat wave that swept across the southern part of Colorado had perfect timing for my camping trip with my fiance, Jenny. We were finally taking a much needed break from our mundane, work filled life and had decided to explore a campground nestled within the Rocky Mountains, far away from the chaos of city life. As we sat around the folding table in our RV, Laughing about an embarrassing moment one of our friends had experienced at brunch a few months prior, our laughter turned into screams. An ear-splitting bang shattered our peace as something struck our RV from the outside. We froze in shock, trying to comprehend what had just happened. Not knowing whether to investigate or to lock ourselves in and call for help, we hesitated. Our mobile signal was nearly non-existent, so summoning any sort of help seemed hardly feasible. Besides, who would come to our rescue this far into the wilderness? In the end, curiosity got the better of us, and we decided to carefully step outside. As we opened the RV door, immediately we were hit by a pungent smell so nauseating that it almost choked us. We gazed on in horror, Scattered all over the floor were dismembered body parts limbs and viscera messily assembled in a grotesque circle around our vehicle. Our stomachs churning with fear, my voice trembled as I spoke. We have to leave, Jenny. No cell signal or not. We need to get out of here. Jenny nodded as she gripped my shaking hand tightly. But before we could even think about starting up the engine and making our way down that treacherous mountain road at night, a tall figure appeared behind our RV from under the thick canopy of trees. He towered over six feet tall with an imposing posture that exuded predatory authority. His face was partially concealed by unkempt facial hair, 
and wild locks of hair so matted that they seemed to fuse with the tangled underbrush. The man's bloodshot eyes burned right through our fear-stricken gaze. As we stared at him, one question hung heavily in the oppressive air before the realization weighed us down even further. Was this hulking demagogue the reason for the carnage we'd stumbled upon? As if reading our thoughts, he started towards us, each of his footfalls echoed in my chest. The faint glint of a blade caught my eye as it swung side to side with each stride. Out of instinct, we made a frantic dash back into our RV, locking every door and window behind us. His enraged yelling penetrated the thin walls, promising imminent death should we not submit. The gut-wrenching sound of metal scraping along our vehicle's body filled our ears as he tried to find a way in. But Jenny noticed something even more terrifying. Other people were emerging from the darkened woods, some wounded and disheveled. Was this their tormentor too? Their jailer? My heart raced as I unsuccessfully tried to start the engine. It had been disabled somehow during our initial shock. In unison, Jenny and I sprang into action, searching for anything within arm's reach that might serve as an impromptu weapon against this assailant. The madman outside continued in his attempts to break in, soon joined by other disturbing figures who had formed a coalition of terror. Every moment felt like an eternity, as we braced ourselves for a confrontation against those who wished us gruesome harm. While Jenny and I frantically looked for improvised weapons in the RV, I noticed a flare gun in one of the compartments. It was a small consolation, but it was better than nothing. I handed it to her and told her to hold it tight but not to use it yet. The pounding on the RV door grew progressively more forceful. The bloodthirsty group outside continued their desperate attempts to break in causing us both to understand that this night could very well be our last if we didn't act quickly. With no cell signal and no means to call for help, our backs were truly against the wall. Suddenly, an idea sprang into my mind. The RV's fire extinguisher might be enough to create a diversion. We could then use the brief window of opportunity to make a run for it further down the mountain and away from these violent assailants. Hastily explaining my plan to Jenny, she agreed that it was all we had at this point. Retrieving the fire extinguisher, I took a moment to brace myself as memories of the earlier carnage flashed before my eyes. But there was no time for hesitation our lives hung in the balance. As luck would have it, just as we were about to enact our plan, we heard heavy footsteps approaching from another part of the woods. A voice loudly commanded them to stop their assault on our RV. Drop your weapons and stand down! The order snapped like thunder in the night air. To our utter disbelief, they obeyed. Their eerie silence after discarding their makeshift weapons added even more tension to the scene unfolding before us. Our unexpected savior stepped out from behind a tree. His figure showed authority and strength. A badge glistening on his chest revealed him as a forest ranger. He began questioning these menacing assailants sternly. What are you doing out here? Assaulting innocent people is a crime. Unexpectedly, the assailants hesitated, their eyes shifting nervously among one another. One of them, a young woman who appeared to be in her twenties, meekly spoke up. Please, we didn't want to do this. He made us that man and threatened to kill us if we didn't help him. The forest ranger continued his interrogation as we listened from inside the RV too afraid to move. It turned out that they had been held captive in a makeshift camp near the mountain's base by the man who now lay dead outside our RV. He had been extorting and coercing them into helping him carry out his malevolent plots against unsuspecting travelers. 
With the intervention of the forest ranger, our harrowing encounter came to a close. The rescued captives were gathered together and led away by additional reinforcements summoned by the ranger via emergency radio. As for Jenny and me, our lives would never be the same after that night on the mountain road. An event as terrifying as this lingers like a dark cloud over your head. The brave forest ranger and other law enforcement officers saved us and many others from an unspeakable fate that evening. Now back home and healing both physically and psychologically from the ordeal, Jenny and I frequently visit the graves of those unfortunate souls who perished at the hands of that unhinged individual on that fateful mountain road. Their memory serves as a somber reminder of just how fragile life can be and how crucial it is to hold on to those you care about because you never know when everything can change in an instant. That July in 1988, I made an offhand remark about trying to perfect a pancake flip for the annual county pancake flipping contest. It's a memory that stands out as one of my last joyful moments before everything went awry. My friends and I, Robert Lovell and Alex Stevenson, the three of us childhood friends, decided to take a break from our mundane lives and have an adventure. We rented an RV and headed towards Yellowstone National Park to soak in the beautiful wilderness, camping under the stars and enjoying nature at its finest. We made our way through the lush forests, bighorn mountains, and crystal clear lakes that the park boasted. As we marveled at the untouched beauty of our surroundings, a strange sense of unease crept into my mind in subtle waves. Unable to shake off this increasing anxiety, I said nothing and continued with our journey. It was dusk when we arrived at our chosen campground situated near majestic waterfalls. Setting up camp in record time, we sat around a crackling campfire, roasting marshmallows and reminiscing about previous camping escapades. Giggling at amusing anecdotes, we brushed off any lingering discomfort in favor of good times. In hindsight, that would be a decision we'd come to regret. Midnight came quickly, and soon enough we settled into our RV for the night. The music from Alex's Walkman lulled us into peaceful slumber, or so it seemed. At some point in the dead of night, I was jolted awake by a deafening crash outside the RV, panicked, I nudged Robert and Alex awake before we peeked through the window. There stood an intimidating figure standing just mere feet away from our parked vehicle, a tall man with unkempt hair and wild eyes staring right into our souls, his jaw clenched and sweat pouring down his face. His bruised knuckles were wrapped around a massive crowbar. Without exchanging words, we each knew that the man was nothing short of trouble. That feeling of unease I faced earlier had metastasized into sheer terror. Robert grabbed his baseball bat, and my hands trembled as I clutched my trusty Swiss Army knife, ready to protect ourselves. Alex held the car keys tightly, waiting for our cue to make a break for it. The man proceeded to circle our RV, scratching at the sides with the pointed end of his crowbar, creating an unbearable screech that sent chills down our spines. We could hear his raspy breathing as he inched closer and closer to our door. It sounded like he repeatedly whispered the word, Freedom. Finally, the door handle began to turn and creak under his forceful grasp. My heart threatened to beat out of my chest while Alex whispered, On three, we bolt. He counted in hushed tones. One, two. A quick decision. Three. Alex flung open the door just as the man had almost gained entry. Robert swung his baseball bat forcefully, 
catching the intruder off guard and knocking him back with a sickening thud. We sprang into action, lunging for the RV door together. Alex found the right key quickly and jammed it into the ignition, revving the engine to life while Robert and I kept our eyes on the man. The man's wild eyes locked onto us as he pushed himself up from the ground. He raised his crowbar once more but hesitated. It seemed as if he was contemplating his next move. Let's go, go, go! Now! I shouted. Alex slammed on the gas pedal, and we began to speed away from our aggressor. We could see in the rearview mirror as he dropped his crowbar in anger and began chasing after us, but the RV accelerated too fast for him to keep up. Within moments, he was left behind in a cloud of dust. Heart racing, my mind processed everything that had just happened. We hadn't wanted to call for help because we feared it would draw attention to us and escalate the situation. But now that we had managed to escape from whatever malicious intent this man had, it was time to reconsider our position. I pulled out my phone and dialed 911 as we continued driving away. 911, what is your emergency? came a calm voice on the other end of the line. We were just attacked at our campsite, I blurted out. A man tried to break into our RV with a crowbar. He looked dangerous and was threatening us. The operator quickly noted down our location details and instructed us to continue driving for safety reasons while they dispatched police officers to investigate. Meanwhile, I also provided her with a detailed description of the attacker tall frame, disheveled hair, sweat-drenched face with bruised knuckles, so they knew what they were looking for. The next few hours felt like a blur of adrenaline, confusion, and fear as we waited for an update from the police. The feeling of safety we had taken for granted while camping suddenly felt like a distant memory. We knew we couldn't go back to the campsite, not after what had just happened, so we parked our RV in a well-lit public parking lot several miles away and stayed there until the police contacted us. Eventually, we received an update. The police arrived at our abandoned campsite and found evidence of the attempted break-in as well as the discarded crowbar. Investigating further, they discovered a rundown shack nearby in which their primary suspect lived. He matched my description perfectly. It turned out that the man had been living off the grid for several years due to mental health issues and unaddressed anger management problems. Freedom, which he whispered repeatedly during the attack, was his way of reminding himself that he was no longer bound by society's rules or expectations. Following our distress call, they apprehended him swiftly without further incident. In the aftermath of this terrifying ordeal, our camping escapades took a backseat to regaining a sense of security and normalcy. By working together and making quick decisions to protect ourselves, we were not only able to escape from harm but also bring an end to one man's reign of terror that lurked at the outskirts of civilization. As time went on and life continued, my trusty Swiss army knife now held more significance. It served as both a reminder of how vulnerable life can sometimes be and the ways in which teamwork, resourcefulness, and determination could help us pull through even the darkest moments. It was the middle of August a few years ago when my best friend, Quinton, and I decided to take a break from our mundane 9-to-5 jobs and spend some time camping in an RV at Yosemite National Park. These precious moments of peace amid the otherwise chaotic life were a treasure to us, like an oasis in the midst of a scorching desert. Little did we know what lay ahead. 
after our first days spent marveling at the majestic scenery and basking in nature's beauty, evening fell. The sun dipped below the horizon, casting an ominous shadow across the land as the air grew cold and crisp. We retreated to our RV, where we passed the time by regaling each other with old college stories that never failed to make us double over with laughter. Later that night, while we both dozed off by the dying firelight, a sudden jolt of terror ripped me from my slumber. An anguished scream echoed through the darkness outside our RV. Inside, Quinton clutched his blanket white-knuckled, praying that it was merely some cruel nocturnal predator acting out its vicious desires. But fear held us hostage, gripping us in its chilling tendrils as we strained our ears for any further sign of danger. Suddenly there came another blood-curdling wail before silence once again encompassed us. Wide-eyed and shaking from fright, Quinton scrambled for his phone to call for help. To our utter dismay, there was no signal. Shouldn't we go out there and check? I asked hesitantly. I don't know, Quinton replied. It might be too dangerous. The paralyzing fear had seeped into every fiber of our being as we sat there wrestling with our doubts. While we were on the verge of stepping out to investigate, we heard footsteps approaching in the darkness outside. That's when he appeared a tall, sinister figure with ominous eyes that seemed to burn into our very souls. His misshapen face closely resembled a macabre mask sculpted from raw sinew and scar tissue, while his body was riddled with deep cuts that oozed a sickly, repugnant pus. He wore tattered, blood-stained clothes that draped over his gaunt frame like the remnants of some dreadful nightmare. Unable to react, Quinton and I stared in mute horror as the monstrous man sauntered towards us with a malicious gleam in his eyes. In one terrifying instant, I fully understood the nature of the gruesome reality we were now part of. As he circled our RV, taunting us with wolfish smiles and guttural chuckles, Quinton and I frantically searched for anything that could serve as a weapon in defense of our lives. I grabbed a frying pan while Quinton wielded an old broomstick. We have to do something. Quinton insisted his voice trembling. Yeah, I replied nervously. But what? The twisted man didn't shy away from keeping us engaged in this nerve-wracking game, occasionally tapping at the RV windows and softly laughing each time we flinched. Then it suddenly dawned on me. This maniac must have been responsible for those harrowing screams, and possibly even worse atrocities. And although we had no idea who he was or why he chose to target us, it became clear that we had to put an end to this horrifying ordeal before another helpless soul fell prey to his sickening schemes. Bracing myself for the terrifying confrontation ahead, I looked over at Quentin, finding resolve in his clenched jaw and determined gaze. We nodded our silent agreement, knowing that there was no turning back now. As the terrifying figure continued to torment us, Quinton decided that our only hope was to try to make a run for it. We can't stay here any longer, he whispered, his face pale and sweaty. If we're going to get out of this alive... We need to make a break for it. With my heart pounding in my chest, I nodded in agreement. I knew that attempting to flee would be risky, but it seemed our only option. We needed help, but there was no way we could call anyone as the monstrous man had destroyed both our phones in his twisted game. Quinton and I clutched our makeshift weapons and carefully opened the RV door. As soon as we stepped outside, the wind carried the horrific stench of decay and rot towards us, making it almost impossible not to retch. That's when we noticed the countless mutilated animal carcasses strewn across the ground nearby, presumably the psychopath's handiwork. 
His laughter echoed through the air as he crept from behind us, wielding a large knife with an unnerving grin spread across his gory face. Moving rapidly, Quinton swung his broomstick at him, landing a blow on his shoulder and buying us precious seconds to run. We dashed through the darkness, our legs pumping with fear-driven adrenaline. Trees and foliage scratched at our skin as we tried to put distance between ourselves and our murderous pursuer. Although he didn't speak as he chased us, we could hear his twisted howls of delight at having us on the run. After what seemed like an eternity, we stumbled upon a small country road. Gasping for breath and soaked with sweat, we stopped momentarily to consider our next move. As both directions looked equally desolate with no signs of help, Quinton made an executive decision. We needed to turn left towards town. Just then, headlights appeared out of nowhere down the opposite end of the street. Quinton flagged down the approaching car, praying that it would stop. The driver, an older man named George, could see the desperation etched on our faces and didn't hesitate to provide assistance. As we hopped into his car and sped off, we quickly explained our horrifying ordeal to him. Without missing a beat, George informed us he was an off-duty police officer, ensuring us we'd be safe with him. He called for backup on his radio as we continued to drive away from the woods. As for the deranged attacker, he was nowhere to be found when the police arrived at the scene. Authorities closed off the area, conducting a thorough search in an attempt to hunt down the man and, and uncover more about what had driven his sadistic behaviors. However, he had vanished without a trace only leaving behind a legacy of fear and gruesome deaths. Although Quinton and I survived that horrifying night, it forever changed our lives. We could still feel a lingering sense of dread every time we closed our eyes. Visions of the man's monstrous face were etched into our memories. In the months that followed, both of us attended counseling sessions to try and overcome the trauma associated with our brush with death. There was no further word on the fate of our attacker. It seemed as though he had disappeared into thin air. One thing was certain. We would never forget that night nor be able to shake off the harrowing realization that somewhere out there, a brutal and twisted killer was still on the loose. Years passed with no news about our attacker or any similar incidents taking place. The disturbing memory eventually began to fade from my thoughts. But there will always be a small part of my mind and soul carrying that dreadful secret, knowing just how close we came to becoming victims ourselves in the hands of twisted evil in human form. It was a crisp October 2017 weekend when my friends and I decided to take a break from our monotonous routines and embark on a camping trip. We loaded up our RV and drove towards the secluded forests of Oregon, hoping for a rejuvenating experience. Little did I know it would ultimately end in a nightmarish ordeal. The first day of our camping trip was uneventful, filled with laughter S. mores, and reminiscing around the campfire. As dusk settled in, we wrapped up our conversations and retired to the RV for a well-deserved rest. My buddy, Casimir Reynolds, rolled out his sleeping bag next to mine while Bernice Summers nestled herself into a corner. It was around midnight when the unmistakable rustling of leaves outside jolted me awake. I groggily crawled toward the window, rubbing my eyes to clear my vision. And that's when I first noticed him, a man standing just beyond the edge of the campsite, staring at our RV with an unwavering gaze. Although it was difficult to discern his features in the dim moonlight, I could tell he was tall and lean, with shoulder-length hair obscuring his face. 
intrigued by his presence but cautious about confronting him, I woke Casimir and pointed out the mysterious figure lurking outside. Casimir squinted at the man before chuckling quietly. Dude's probably just drunk or lost. He'll be gone by morning. Unconvinced but clinging to Casimir's reassurance, we returned to sleep. To our surprise, the next day brought no sign of the stranger lurking outside our campsite. But as the sun began to set once more, an oppressive sense of unease gripped my spine. By evening, Casimir's jovial grin had faded as he nervously glanced around the dark woods surrounding us. I have an idea, let's play a game, piped up Bernice, sensing our tension. It'll help break the ice, and maybe even kick that creepy dread to the curb. We hesitantly agreed, opting for a game of cards and sharing silly stories about our past misadventures. But as the night wore on, so did our dread. By 3 a.m., our laughter had all but died down, and we sat in somber silence. The discomfort was tangible and engulfed us all when suddenly, the RV's door creaked open. Without hesitation, Casimir lunged towards the door and slammed it shut. There's no way we left that unlocked, he exclaimed, his voice hinting at panic. We couldn't bring ourselves to open it again and check who or what was trying to enter. That night none of us managed to sleep a wink. Casimir whispered that we should stay alert and not let our guards down even for a second. Anxiety prevailed over fatigue. The sun finally broke through the darkness of the forest, bringing with it a modicum of safety. But any hopes of respite vanished when Bernice went outside to fetch some wood and recoiled in shock at what she found. Meticulously arranged piles of branches and leaves formed an unnerving message. I see you. We couldn't deny it anymore. Someone was stalking us. Casimir clenched his fist in frustration as fear laced his voice. We should call for help. Why haven't we done that already? He questioned angrily, his face pale. Bernice produced her phone from her pocket, but the screen showed no signal. In the vast expanse of Oregon's forest land, we were cut off from help entirely. Determined to protect ourselves, we crafted makeshift weapons from our camping gear while taking turns keeping watch day and night. Our initial escapism had spiraled into a ghastly world of terror, and the anticipation of the stalker's next move gnawed at our sanity. As night closed in again, our vigilance heightened. The woods seemed to be alive with the whispers of unknown danger. And then there he was, the tall figure materializing from the shadows with a menacing grin that sent shivers down my spine. We mustered all our courage and fear-fueled adrenaline in an attempt to confront this malevolent being. But as we approached him, wielding our makeshift weapons, he fearlessly and effortlessly dodged our every blow. Our futile attempts at overcoming the menacing figure only seemed to increase his sinister delight. His laughter echoed through the trees, as if the forest itself was mocking us. His unkempt hair, chiseled features, and eyes that gleamed with malevolence left no doubt in our minds. This man was dangerous. We knew we had to flee to survive. Casimir spoke up abruptly. There's a ranger station not too far from here. We might find help there. Bernice nodded, and we all silently agreed it was our best, and probably only, chance. We left the RV behind, fearing that it would only slow us down. Our pace quickened as we made our way through the dense woods, guided by Casimir's knowledge of the area. The frightening presence of our stalker seemed inescapable, knowing that he could be lurking behind any tree. As we approached the ranger station, relief washed over us. It was still intact and looked functional. 
I banged on the door desperately while Bernice attempted to radio for help. There was no response from within. Bernice's efforts to contact someone were fruitless as well. No signal seemed to penetrate these unyielding forests. Let's search the place, Casimir suggested wearily. There must be some kind of communication system or weapon we can use. The small building yielded nothing but empty rooms and broken equipment. It seemed as though the ranger station had been abandoned for a long time. As night began to fall upon us once more, we felt desperation settling in like a cold wind. It was clear that we couldn't stay at the station. Our stalker would find us eventually. We needed a new plan. Our best bet is to keep moving, Casimir admitted reluctantly. But we need to rest first. We found temporary solace underneath the seemingly protective canopy of trees outside the ranger station. Our bodies ached from exhaustion as we huddled together for warmth and some semblance of safety. By the time daylight graced us with its presence, we decided to head south. Our hope was to find a road, a house, anything that could lead to communication with the outside world. We knew our stalker was still hunting us, but our will to survive far outweighed the fear that held us captive in his twisted game. It felt like an eternity had passed when we stumbled upon a small cabin tucked away near a narrow dirt road. The sight of it revitalized our spirits and sparked fresh determination within us. The cabin appeared deserted, but that didn't deter us from seeking its shelter as a temporary haven. As we barreled through the door, we finally found what we had been searching for, a working phone. Wasting no time, Casimir frantically dialed for help while Bernice and I scoured the cabin for any means of self-defense. Our anticipation rose with every passing ring. This phone call could be our true salvation. When assistance finally answered on the other end, Casimir's voice quivered with exhaustion and relief as he recounted everything that had happened excluding some gruesome details for the sake of our own sanity. After providing our location, assurance was given that help was on the way. The wait seemed interminable as our fearful anticipation continued to heighten. Would this deadly cat-and-mouse game come to an end? Could we actually make it out alive? With the arrival of rescue came an overwhelming sense of both elation and disbelief. Clawing at what remained of our strength and hope, we collectively breathed sighs of relief as we were whisked away by paramedics who cautiously approached the eerie woods where our horrific ordeal had unfolded. The authorities searched relentlessly in hopes of capturing our stalker but found no trace or clue as to his whereabouts or identity. Despite their fruitless investigation, our lives would never be the same again. Years later, as my thoughts linger on those lost in that forest of darkness, Casimir, Bernice, and I still hold on to the memory of our harrowing experience. Though our paths have since diverged, we are forever bound by a chilling reminder that somewhere out there, our stalker roams free, watching and waiting for his next victims. I'll never forget that bizarre trip back in March 2008. My life had changed inexplicably when I found myself waking up after a short night of tossing and turning in my RV. The campground in Eureka Springs, Arkansas, had seemed like the perfect getaway for someone like me an insurance claims adjuster who just needed a break from the usual grind. After downing far too many energy drinks, I decided to head outside and stretch my legs. My buddy Riley and his wife Chloe were there too, cracking jokes as we shuffled through the cool morning air. So what are the odds of us finding Bigfoot out here? 
Riley joked as we made our way through the leaf-covered ground. Suddenly, we noticed that one of the other campers near us had their tent ripped apart by something sharp. It wasn't that close to us, but still uncomfortably close. There were blood stains on the pieces of torn fabric that slowly disappeared into the woods. It was gnarly. No way some animal did that. Chloe gasped, horror clear on her face. We continued cautiously along the path when we stumbled upon a phone lying on the ground. It looked like it had been used as a makeshift weapon it was cracked and covered in blood. As we examined it more closely, panic set in. Come on guys, let's go back to the RV, I suggested nervously. At dusk, as we sat by our campfire trying to make sense of what happened earlier, we heard footsteps approaching from a distance. Suddenly a man appeared before us. He was tall and lanky, with intense and soulless eyes peering out from beneath a sweaty fringe of greasy hair. His aroma was one of a week's worth of unwashed clothing, not pleasant at all. Don't mind me he said casually while stealing glances at each of us before disappearing into the darkness effortlessly. His presence sent chills down our spines, and we exchanged concerned glances. That night, Chloe suddenly squealed like she was briefly in pain. What's wrong? Riley asked. I don't know. Felt like something stung or bit me in my sleep, she replied rubbing her arm. The next morning, we found peculiar messages etched into the side of the parked RV while a pungent smell filled the air. This man was toying with us now, making us paranoid and scared, purposely ruining our peaceful vacation. We were fully aware that something dangerous and horrifying visiting our campground in the dead of night. We began to pack up quickly wanting to leave immediately after being freaked out by the odd occurrences thus far. However, our plans were thwarted as we discovered that our tire was slashed, so clearly and efficiently that we knew it had to be intentional. Riley, Chloe, I think it's time we call for help, I said urgently as my heart raced. They both nodded in agreement. Unfortunately, in this remote area, there was no signal on any of our phones. This level of isolation felt suffocating now that we realized the unsettling truth. We were trapped here with an unhinged man literally terrorizing us. Frantically searching for any mode of transportation or communication, we suddenly stumbled upon what seemed to be a small workshop in a hidden part of the campground. If you could call it that, it was more like a shed from hell with sinister stains all over the floor and walls and what looked like hunting equipment everywhere. What is going on here? Chloe whispered uneasily as we investigated further into this mysterious place. A sudden noise made us jump, footsteps approaching, loud stomp, stomp, stomp getting closer and closer at an increasingly rapid pace. Fear permeated through each fiber of our beings as Riley shouted, Hide! We hid in different corners of the workshop, hoping the approaching man wouldn't find us. Our hearts pounded loudly as we tried our best to make no noise. The man entered the room, and I could see him clearly now. He was tall and thin, with shaggy hair and a wild, sinister grin on his face. His eyes were deep-set and gave off a cold, unfeeling stare. The man searched the room for us, slowly and methodically. Riley couldn't take it any longer and made a dash for the door, attempting to escape. He shouted at us to do the same. Chloe followed suit, but as I went to join them, the man lunged at me and grabbed my arm with a rough grip. His nails dug into my flesh like razors as he growled menacingly. Riley and Chloe made their way back in a panic to help me. Together, 
they attacked our antagonist with whatever blunt objects they could find in the workshop. He winced at each hit but didn't relent in his grasp on my arm. You three are quite entertaining, he said mockingly. But I can't have you leaving just yet. His intention was now clear, to torture or maim us for his own sadistic pleasure. Just as all hope seemed lost, we heard sirens wailing in the distance. The campground's owner had heard our screams and called the police without our knowledge. Realizing that his window for tormenting us was closing, our attacker threw me against the wall and sprinted toward the exit. I hit my head hard on impact but managed to keep conscious. Riley helped me up as Chloe watched the villain disappear into the nearby woods. The police arrived at the scene shortly after and informed us that they would do everything in their power to apprehend this dangerous individual. We were grateful to be alive and relatively unharmed, though our once peaceful vacation had been transformed into a nightmare. Our minds raced as we recounted the harrowing events to the officers. Days passed, and the local police assured us that they had tracked down the unhinged man in the woods. With him in custody, we heaved a massive sigh of relief. Our nightmare was finally over, and justice would prevail. As we went on with our lives, we couldn't help but remember those we lost along our agonizing journey, campers who hadn't been as fortunate in avoiding the clutches of this sadistic villain. The attacks left us with numerous scars, both mental and physical, that would forever serve as a reminder that monsters do exist. That terrible occurrence taught us to cherish life and those around us, for danger may lurk in what seems to be the most peaceful settings. We often talked about that fateful camping trip and how things could have turned out differently if luck hadn't been on our side. However difficult it was to come to terms with the terrifying events, we knew that facing our fears was the only way to truly heal from the trauma. And in some strange way, it made us appreciate life even more than before. As I awkwardly tried to adjust the parking brake of the rented RV, my girlfriend Jenna had just finished hanging up a ridiculously tacky string of festive lights inside that seemed to stretch halfway across Missouri. We had decided to spend our vacation in Mark Twain National Forest, taking a break from the hustle and bustle of city life. It was June 2010, and a refreshing summer breeze set the tone for our romantic getaway. That's what it was supposed to be, anyway. Little did we know it would become anything but. Considering ourselves true, foodies, we were excited to finally have a chance at cooking our authentic gourmet campfire meal. Bacon wrapped scallops on skewers, arguing over whether the seasoning mix needed more garlic powder. Unbeknownst to me, Jenna thought it best to surprise me with this tofu version she'd found online, and I must say, her laughter still echoes in my mind as my first bite betrayed me. Our relaxation and culinary adventures were short-lived. The sun dipped low in the sky as we decided to venture out for an evening stroll close to campsite. The beautiful sights and smells of the forest never ceased to amaze us. Lulled into tranquility by our surroundings, we hadn't initially noticed when night began to swallow the daylight. The piece took a sharp turn as we saw a plume of smoke rising from the direction of our campsite. Heart pounding in anticipation of the worst having happened, our RV consumed by flames, we broke into a sprint in unison. Instead of fire, however, we were greeted by something far more disturbing. The scene that lay before us was nothing short of horrifying. All our camping gear had been strewn about recklessly. Our fancy cooking utensils hung dangling from nearby tree branches like coiled snakes. 
The door frame of our RV ripped near clean off its hinges. Blood covered some of the broken shards still connected to the RV's frame. Yet there was no fire to be seen. Jenna, we need to get help. I cried out, my mind racing. Stammering through her shock at seeing our temporary home in ruins, she managed to squeak out. The nearest park office is miles away. Feeling a sense of duty, I refused to back down. But we have to do something. We can't just leave everything here like this. Before either of us could continue arguing or take action, a rustling from our left took hold of our undivided attention. Peeking from behind a tree trunk was the most horrifying sight I'd ever laid eyes upon. A man, incredibly tall and lithe, his face and body so heavily scarred it was as if they were carved by some twisted sculptor. Some wild strands of hair grew from his pale skull, while his eyes burned into ours with a malevolent intensity I had never experienced before in my life. The words caught in my throat as I tried to stammer out a challenge or inquiry. Jenna, however, found her voice before I could muster mine and screamed for all she was worth. The sound of her voice seemed to ignite something within the man. Like an unhinged beast driven mad by wild hunger, he careered toward us with staggering speed. With the horrifying man charging towards us, I grabbed Jenna's hand and pulled her with me as we sprinted away from the chaos. Our hearts pounded in our chests, and our breathing became erratic. We knew that running away was our only chance for survival, and that calling for help at this point might only attract more danger. We stumbled through the woods, the man's inhuman sounds echoing through the trees, it sounded like a mix between a choking cough and an animal growl, sending shivers down our spines. The woods had suddenly turned into a maze of haunting destruction, making it difficult for us to stay on track. As we rounded a tree, Jenna tripped, her legs giving out beneath her. I quickly crouched down to help her up when we heard something that made me hesitate, rustling leaves from behind us. Unwilling to wait any longer, I scooped Jenna's arm around my shoulder and heaved her up with great difficulty. As we pressed on, I noticed the attacker's scent growing stronger. It was a nauseating combination of rot and decay that burned our nostrils. We could also see his numerous scars more vividly now. They appeared infected and purposeful as if his injuries were self-inflicted symbols of his twisted psyche. Finally, after what seemed like an eternity of running, Jenna's voice broke through my panic. There's a cabin over there. She pointed to a small wooden structure in the distance. Let's hide there until he goes away. I hesitated at first but realized it was perhaps the only thing standing between us and certain death. We made our way towards it while trying to avoid making any noises that could alert our pursuer. Once inside the cabin, we hid behind some dusty furniture with bated breaths. The familiar noise of rustling leaves returned. We knew he was getting closer. I stared at Jenna with eyes wide in terror, trying to contain the urge to scream as the man came into view through the window. His gait was unnerving, slow and deliberate with a jerky, jagged motion that made his limbs twitch with every step. He circled the cabin, searching for us with an incredible intensity, his eyes filled with a horrifying rage. Jenna and I remained silent, praying for him to give up his pursuit. After discerning we were correctly hidden from his sight, he moved to stalk elsewhere. We dared not breathe, waiting for what felt like hours to be sure he had gone. Finally, we gathered enough courage to move from our hiding place. Hesitantly, we ventured out of the cabin and made our way back through the woods towards where we last heard distant voices, hoping desperately that there were park rangers or other campers nearby who could help us. 
As we neared these voices, our fear began to wane. We told them our harrowing tale, describing in detail the scar-covered man who destroyed our campsite and chased us through the woods. Their reactions ranged from disbelief to dismay. However, they all agreed that we needed assistance immediately. They led us towards the park ranger's office where we informed them of our attacker. They listened carefully and were alarmed by our story, promising to search for this seemingly demented individual. Before leaving the park behind entirely, all of us paid a final visit to our wrecked campsite. The chilled sight of bloodstains on shards from the RV served as an eerie reminder of just how lucky we'd been to escape. Despite the fact that he was never found nor identified by park authorities or other campers in the area, Jenna and I remained deeply affected by our encounter with this twisted man who haunted our camping trip. Grateful for having escaped with our lives intact, we acknowledge those who helped us during such a dark and gruesome ordeal. Years have passed, but the memories of that frightening day still lurk in the back of my mind. It reminds me that sometimes, evil exists in the world beyond our understanding, and there are events that we may never fully comprehend. We may be left only with harrowing reminders of terror-filled moments that, while they bind us together in shared tragedy, cause us to examine the depths to which a human being can sink into darkness. It was my cousin Emma's birthday, and it happened in June 2012. To celebrate, she decided to rent an RV and go camping for the weekend at this remote lake in Utah. We invited a handful of friends along Mariana, Niles, and Caitlin. I never expected things to take such a turn. A few days before departure, an odd accident occurred when I crushed my pinky finger with a door at home, slowly turning it a hideous blue and purple hue. At least it won't attract any bugs, I joked to Emma. We arrived at the campground on a warm Saturday afternoon. The lake was surrounded by dense forests, giving it a sense of isolation and tranquility. Our surroundings were beautiful but somehow foreboding. The five of us set up camp near the waterfront and enjoyed the early evening mingling around the fire pit while roasting marshmallows. As we swapped stories about embarrassing high school memories, Caitlin mentioned seeing a man fishing by the lake earlier. We hadn't noticed anyone else around tents or RVs nearby. A little curious but unperturbed, Niles casually jokingly mentioned, Probably just someone knowing all the best fishing spots. However, as night fell, we began to feel uneasy while we cleaned up our dinnerware in darkness. Muffled footsteps seemed to echo in the woods around us. Leaves crunching accompanied by quiet snaps of twigs cracking underfoot. Mariana suggested we lock the RV doors for safety measures just to be cautious so we did just that once inside our temporary shelter although none of us could shake that ominous prickle of fear stemmed from an undeniable feeling that had no basis in certainty. By bedtime, We'd calmed down somewhat after laughing at some hilarious jokes that Niles shared about his awkward blind date experience from college days which ended disastrously with him unintentionally ruining her fancy dress during dessert. It lightened up our mood, and we crawled into our bunks, grateful for the safety of the RV walls around us. Early morning light infiltrated through the windows, painting the interior a golden hue. Yawning, I opened the door to stretch my legs and was startled by a horrific sight, blood-soaked earth and disarray everywhere. Chairs were overturned, shreds of torn clothing scattered among deep gashes dug into the dirt accompanied by a nauseating metallic odor. Panicking, I slammed the RV door shut, shaking Emma awake with urgency in my trembling voice. 
Something terrible happened outside. We need to call for help. It didn't take long for Emma to comprehend before she started fumbling for her phone. As we scrambled through our belongings desperately searching for cell service, Mariana came upon a scene just off our campsite, a brutally mauled deer carcass, its once pristine white fur now mottled with crimson and entrails strewn over bushes nearby. The brutality caused bile to rise in my throat, and I could hardly believe what I was witnessing. Niles examined the carnage closer, while Caitlin nervously observed our surroundings uneasy whether whoever committed this atrocity was still lurking nearby watching us powerless victims devoid of any protection without cellular signal aware that we hadn't managed to make an emergency call yet due to non-existent signal strength adding pressure mounting stakes against dwindling hope in this increasingly dire predicament. Terrified by this ominous discovery, we debated if we could afford waiting until daylight before making the risky trek back towards town hoping no assailant would stumble across our path since we weren't equipped or prepared to defend ourselves especially considering our large exposed camper unable to remain hidden from view without driving it back down the road which seemed far too dangerous given current circumstances. After calming down, we decided to pack our things quickly and leave the campsite as soon as possible. We still had no cell service, and the closest town was a few hours away by foot, but we had little choice, knowing that remaining here would be even more dangerous. As we walked down the dirt road, Emma tried her phone again, hoping to pick up a signal. But there was still nothing. The hours passed in near silence as each of us remained vigilant to any signs of danger. Just when we thought we were in the clear, we noticed movement in the bushes ahead. A man stepped out onto the road before us, blocking our path. He had wild unkempt hair and clothes soiled with dirt and bloodstains. His entire demeanor radiated an aura of tension. His intense gaze was locked on us. We froze in our tracks, not knowing what to do or how to handle the situation. The man stood motionless for a moment before taking slow steps towards us. Instinctively, we all started backing away, sensing imminent danger. Mariana whispered urgently, Can somebody try calling for help again? We can't take this guy on by ourselves. Emma frantically pulled out her phone once more in an unsuccessful attempt to find a signal. The realization that no help was coming intensified our growing terror. The deranged man closed the distance between us rapidly as our retreat turned into a chaotic flight. As we strained to put some distance between him and ourselves, I caught a glimpse of the damage he had inflicted on the deer earlier. They were unmistakable claw-like marks from his ragged fingernails. Suddenly, Caitlin tripped over a root hidden beneath dead leaves and crumpled to the ground screaming for help as she saw him advancing upon her relentlessly. Niles and I couldn't just abandon her there but knew confronting him would be out of the question. So we grabbed her by the arms, lifted her up, and resumed our frantic run. The man continued to pursue us. It was evident that he wouldn't stop until he had caught us. With the last shred of our failing strength, we stumbled upon a dense forest leading to a narrow ravine as we crashed through the underbrush. As we darted across the ravine in a desperate bid to shake him off our trail, the man suddenly stopped and just watched us, an unsettling smile spreading across his face. He didn't continue to pursue but turned and walked back into the woods in the direction from which he had come. We were baffled by his sudden retreat and were left with nothing but a deep sense of dread that he would return eventually as an ever-looming threat. As we neared town, panting and bruised from our flight, help finally arrived in the form of a law enforcement officer who had been alerted by concerned locals. 
We described our encounter with the demented man in thorough detail while exhausted as the officer promised to search for and apprehend him before anyone else could fall prey to his mania to protect not only ourselves but also others who could unknowingly cross paths with him. Returning home, we breathed a sigh of relief knowing that this harrowing experience finally had come to an end. The horrible incident at the campsite served as a chilling reminder of how life can drastically change on a dime. One moment you're sharing hilarious stories with friends, and the next, fleeing for your lives from a deranged killer in the woods. As time passed, we began to find solace in remembering Caitlin's quick thinking as it potentially saved our lives from that unhinged predator. Our horrific ordeal would never be forgotten but served as a reminder to always be aware of your surroundings and adapt to whatever threats may arise. Last July, camping with my best friend Danny in an RV at Shenandoah National Park, I never thought we'd have a story to tell that was different from any regular camping trip. We'd spent the day hiking and laughing at each other's bad jokes because, well, ordinary people find bad jokes funny. The only thing that was out of place was when we first arrived, and we noticed some broken glass and scorch marks near our campsite. Bunch of jokers must have had a ball with fireworks or something, Danny remarked, but his tone wasn't as carefree as it usually was. By that evening, we'd almost forgotten about what we'd seen. The park ranger came by for the usual hitch-up inspections and safety checks. Oh, about that burnt area you'd asked me earlier, he said to us after exchanging some pleasantries. There has been some strange activity around recently with reports of attacks on campsites. Wait, what do you mean by attacks? I questioned him skeptically. Well, he hesitated. Don't want to scare you folks. It might just be a vagabond or some kids causing trouble. Best if you stay alert and report anything unusual you see. Danny and I were left troubled by what the ranger said, but tried not to dwell on it too much. We cooked dinner and played cards under our RV awning into the night until we decided to call it quits. As I settled into my side of the bed, Danny asked curiously from across the cramped RV room, Hey man, why did the bicycle fall over? I don't know why. Because it was too tired. He chuckled at his own joke, which made me roll my eyes before drifting off to sleep. Sometime in the night, the comforting silence was shattered by a shrieking metallic sound outside our RV. Both of us woke abruptly, trying to orient ourselves in the darkness. Stay here, I whispered to Danny as I fumbled to find my flashlight and cautiously stepped outside the RV. The area was completely deserted, and the only sound I could hear was the wind rustling through the trees. Scanning with my flashlight over the ground, I noticed shards of broken metal and glass littered across our camping spot. A sense of dread crept up on me as I realized this looked very similar to that mysterious burnt area we saw earlier. Did all those campsite attacks have something in common? I quickly scrambled back indoors and alerted Danny to what I saw. His face paled yet didn't betray any fear. We had already gone through a lot together, and pulling each other through rough times had always been our strength. I'll stay outside to keep watch. Lock all doors and windows, he said determinedly. No, we both stay outside together. I refused not wanting any of us alone in this creepy situation. Together, we took up positions behind a large tree just outside the RV with our flashlights aimed towards the possible direction of whatever or whoever attacked. Hours went by, and nothing suspicious happened. 
We were starting to feel restless when suddenly a figure appeared at the edge of our flashlight beams. He was tall, disheveled, with matted hair and clothes that seemed tattered beyond recognition. He moved without purpose as if trying to intimidate us. For a moment, he just stood there, gesturing animatedly towards us while muttering indistinct words under his breath. In unison, Danny and I gathered up all the courage we could muster and shouted sternly at him to leave before we called for help. But he didn't listen. Instead, he began charging towards us while gripping a twisted metallic object in one hand that looked like it had come straight from some nightmarish machinery. My whole body shook with fear, sensing no hope of escaping once this madman gets hold of us. I glanced at Danny, witnessing the same dread reflected in his eyes. This was not an ordinary camping trip gone awry but a fight for our lives. We knew we had to push through the paralyzing fear, so I picked up those shards of metal and glass lying nearby and hurled them to create a distraction while Danny rushed over to the RV. As the shards of metal and glass flew through the air, the disheveled man momentarily hesitated, giving Danny just enough time to reach the RV. I watched as he frantically fumbled to unlock the door. My heart raced as I realized that I had to run for it too. The sound of footsteps pacing towards us felt deafening. Danny yelled at me to make a run for it, and my legs finally sprang into action. Just as I reached the RV door, Danny pulled me inside and slammed it shut, immediately locking all exits. We were panting heavily when we realized that our phones were left outside by the tree where we had kept watch. The thought of venturing out again was terrifying but not as horrifying as being trapped without any means to call for help. Gathering our courage once more, I grabbed a can of pepper spray from my bag while Danny armed himself with a frying pan. We exchanged determined nods and flung the door open. As we approached the tree cautiously, we spotted our phones lying on the grass. Just as Danny bent down to pick them up, the twisted man leaped out from behind a bush, swinging his metallic weapon directly at him. Reacting on pure instinct, I aimed my pepper spray at his face while Danny swung his improvised weapon towards his chest. The attacker's scream combined with a clang echoed in my ears as he staggered back, disarmed and writhing in pain from the spray's effect. It was our chance to retrieve our phones and get back inside before he recovered. Once safely locked inside again, we wasted no time dialing 911 to inform them of our situation. They assured us that they would dispatch officers immediately and advised us not to engage any further with our attacker. Relief washed over us momentarily. Help was on its way. While waiting for law enforcement to arrive, we remained vigilant. Through a small crack in the RV window, I observed the man stumble around in pain, eventually collapsing to the ground. When the officers finally arrived, we nervously stepped out of our haven, feeling somehow protected by their presence. They apprehended the suffering attacker and secured the area, while another officer took our statements. We described everything we experienced, from finding the burnt campsite to witnessing this menacing figure and his seemingly senseless acts of violence. The officers informed us that they suspected the attacker was involved in multiple incidents similar to what we went through. They thanked us for remaining vigilant and providing enough information to help piece together a possible case against him. Though relieved that it was over, Danny and I couldn't shake the sick feeling in our stomachs when we learned later that several campers had lost their lives or suffered serious injuries as a result of this nameless terror. Reminiscing about their unfortunate fate made us realize how truly fortunate we were to have escaped relatively unharmed. That night changed our perspective on camping, 
No longer would it feel like an innocent getaway where we could escape into nature's warm embrace. Instead, we would carry a heightened sense of urgency and awareness, understanding that danger could be lurking in even the most unsuspecting corners. It was the summer of July 2016, and I couldn't remember the last time I felt this relaxed. True, my RV didn't have the most advanced technology or an unlimited supply of cold drinks, but it had something no high-end hotel could ever replicate. The soothing hum of crickets and wind brushing through the trees. That being said, I decided on a trip to soak up the tranquility of nature in Delaware's White Clay Creek State Park. My name is Clarence Witherspoon. Told you my name wasn't a popular one. I'm a 32-year-old accountant from Philadelphia who could use some peaceful respite from the big city's constant noise. Venturing into nature reminded me of simpler times while growing up in a small suburb. I was doing what most people did on their vacations, relaxing, soaking up the sun, and enjoying some outdoor activities. One afternoon, while sharing a round of beers with other campers at our fire pit, we were startled by a furious scream that brought our conversation to an abrupt halt. Rushing toward the source of distress just several yards away from our campsite, one of our neighbors had cut himself badly while attempting to chop wood for the fire. The gory sight prompted me to help while others contacted park authorities for assistance. Grateful for swift intervention from park officials, we all decided that night needed no further excitement and collectively turned in early. Little did we know that our relaxing getaway would soon transmute into a heart-pulsating nightmare. The next day started out as perfectly ordinary, if that word can still be used in such ominous retrospect. As dusk approached, I began organizing a light hike through one of the many trails scattered throughout White Clay Creek State Park with some new friends from neighboring campsites, Tobias Hawthorne, Karen Schneider, and DeAndre Ortega. On our path through dense forestry and breathtaking scenery, we shared stories about our experiences in the great outdoors, building new friendships with jokes and laughter. However, as we advanced along the trail, distant sounds of snapping branches occasionally caught our attention. We credited the noises to some large animals like deer or coyotes and remained vigilant but never thought much of it. As the sun began to set, a horrible stench suddenly filled the air. It was unbearable, unlike anything we experienced before. The repulsive odor was an unpleasant mix of old garbage, rotting fish, and chemicals burning from a distance. We covered our faces with shirts and bandanas while attempting to quicken our pace back to the campsite. The forest grew darker as twilight enveloped us, and those unsettling noises started again, only this time they sounded closer. As Tobias picked up the pace, DeAndre proposed we take a shortcut off trail that had been mentioned earlier by one of the park rangers. We knew veering off the beaten path wasn't always a good idea, but we also knew that getting back to camp swiftly was crucial for our safety. Uncertainty ensued as we lost sight of the primary trail. It wasn't long until we abruptly stumbled upon an unsettling scene that none of us could have ever imagined finding in these woods. The suffocating odor had intensified tremendously around a small clearing where mangled vehicle parts were strewn about amidst torn camping gear. Immediately recognizing this scene as eerily similar to one of those terrifying true crime shows I enjoyed so much on TV, my mind raced with dreadful thoughts as we all exchanged terrified glances. 
This twistedness suddenly shattered our thin veil of protection from believing such unimaginable horrors only exist on screen when out from behind a tree's cover appeared a man mostly obscured by shadows. His posture was twisted and abnormal, his silhouette framed with dripping blood-soaked rags, seemingly an amalgamation of nightmare sketches from the recesses of fevered minds. Fighting against every urge to flee, I strained to see his face for any recognizable features but quickly realized the gravity of my mistake. His eyes locked onto mine with the intensity of a predator preparing to strike. Realizing we had stumbled into his lair, our instincts took over. My mind raced as I tried to comprehend the horror unfolding before us. The twisted man advanced towards us with a cruel grin. I knew we only had one option. Run! I yelled, and my friends didn't hesitate to sprint in the opposite direction. Despite our panic, I managed to fumble for my cell phone in my pocket. As soon as it was in hand, I dialed 911. What's your emergency? The dispatcher asked calmly. There's a man out here in the woods, I gasped, trying to catch my breath as we continued running. He looks dangerous. We found wreckage everywhere, and there was blood. Please send help. Stay on the line, she instructed firmly. I'm sending search and rescue as well as law enforcement teams to your location right now. I couldn't believe how far this psychopath had gone undetected. That he could live out here, possibly murdering innocent people without anyone knowing about him was deeply disturbing a testament to his cunning madness. As we ran through the forest, it was apparent that the man was stalking us. We heard branches snapping and leaves rustling not too far away. We tried to help each other navigate through the dark underbrush but fear took precedence over any semblance of teamwork. Suddenly, Tobias tripped over an exposed tree root and fell hard onto the ground. As DeAndre and I stopped to help him, we saw that he was clutching his leg in agony. My ankle, he groaned in pain. We have to keep moving, DeAndre urged. Desperate to get away from that monstrous figure pursuing us relentlessly, we hauled Tobias up between us and half-carried him while limping at breakneck speed. Moments later, searchlights pierced through the darkness of the forest ahead of us. The relief upon seeing those beams of light felt like a lifeline. I knew that we were finally safe. Sirens wailed louder with each step we took, announcing the approaching rescuers. We burst out of the forest and into a clearing, where the police and park rangers were waiting with multiple vehicles. The sight of their presence brought a flood of relief but also reminded us there's still horror to confront. As officers rushed towards us, we recounted our terrifying encounter with the twisted man in the woods. Upon hearing our story, they urged us to stay together and remain within the safety of their vehicles while they investigated further. We obliged, keeping Tobias' leg elevated and hoping desperately that the nightmare was over. While we huddled together, I couldn't help but think about the fate of all the unidentified victims whose remains we stumbled upon. Their families had no idea what horrors befell their loved ones, instead left to live in a continuous limbo of unanswered questions and sorrow. Hours later, the officers returned from their venture into the forest having successfully apprehended the sinister figure that nearly cost us our lives. We shuddered at hearing his restraints creaking under tension as they led him away. He was later identified as a notorious serial killer who had been evading capture for many years. News quickly spread about our harrowing experience that led to his eventual arrest and brought closure to countless grieving families. In the days that followed, 
my friends and I attended several memorial services held for those lost souls whose lives had been cruelly taken by this heinous murderer. Although relieved by his capture, our hearts ached for those who never got a chance to survive as we did. Our once simple camping trip turned into a brutal survival journey, one that none of us ever anticipated experiencing firsthand. And while our own lives picked up from where they left off before that fateful day in those sinister woods, we would never forget the darkness we encountered nor the innocent victims whose tragic fates intertwined with our own. It was around the time when the leaves just started to change colors giving off that nostalgic autumn vibe. My friend Erica and I had decided to go on a camping trip to enjoy some time away from our mundane lives. The destination we chose was a beautiful spot in Montana called Lake McDonald. Both of us were excited to relax and recharge, eager for whatever adventure a camping trip might offer. The setup for our weekend getaway couldn't be better, a cozy RV parked mere steps away from the pristine lake and a scenic view of the surrounding mountains. Laughter filled the air as we exchanged memories from our past, spreading warmth through the crisp evening. And of course, we couldn't leave out the campfire as mores. They were tradition after all. What do you call a fake noodle? An impasta! I joked, lighting up the atmosphere even more. Erica could barely contain her laughter despite having heard it before. You're such a dork. But hey, that's what camping trips are for, dorky jokes and all. Our laughter was soon interrupted by some faint rustling in the bushes behind us. Although skeptical at first, we convinced ourselves it was probably just some harmless wildlife passing through maybe even a friendly squirrel enjoying its own late-night snack. A few minutes went on and soon enough, we forgot about the incident entirely. It became drowned out by more of Erica's and my shared memories and jokes. However, that innocent ignorance was short-lived. After roasting another batch of gooey marshmallows, we decided it was time to head back inside our RV to rest up for more hiking adventures tomorrow. But as soon as we turned toward our temporary home on wheels, we saw something chilling, something unexpected. There he stood in front of our RV door, a man dressed in tattered clothes that hung loosely from his thin frame. A thick beard covered his face, masking any discernible emotion. Though we could only see glimpses of his eyes from beneath his matted hair, it was enough to send a shiver down our spines. Startled and unsure how he got so close to us without being noticed, Erica and I exchanged a glance before mumbling words of disbelief. He must have been hiding in plain sight, I whispered, feeling nauseous at the thought. Before we had time to react any further, the man started inching closer to us. It was that exact moment when we realized there was no way to call for help. Our cell phones were locked away in the RV, completely out of reach. I looked into Erica's eyes and knew what she was thinking. She had seen the small leather belt wrapped tightly around the man's hand as he approached us. He must have had a weapon of some sort tucked under that dirty mess of a shirt too but what were we supposed to do against such a threat? The man crept closer still, beads of sweat forming on his grimy forehead as a crooked smile began to show on his face. Tension hung in the air, thickening with each step that brought him nearer. Look! Erica exclaimed suddenly, pointing to something behind the man. Night rainbows! The sight of the supposed night rainbows caught the man's attention, his head swiveling for a moment. Still, it wasn't enough to stop him. Realizing that our attempt at distraction had failed, 
I turned to Erica once more, this time taking a chance by quickly whispering, Run! We sprinted away from the campfire and deep into the forest with a speed we didn't know we had. My heartbeat pounded furiously in my chest as we zigzagged through the trees, trying to create as much distance as possible between us and the dangerous stranger. Unfortunately, fate was not on our side. An agonizing pain shot through my leg as I stepped on something sharp and lost my balance. I collapsed onto the ground with a pained cry, unable to stand back up. Erica looked at me with despair and fear as the sound of footsteps grew closer. Our minds raced for an option, any option, that could ensure our survival. Stay here, Erica pleaded in an urgent whisper. I'll go find help. Blinking back tears that threatened to spill over, I nodded vigorously knowing she had no other choice. Watching her dash away into the darkness, I prepared myself for whatever gruesome act I would have to face when the relentless antagonist caught up to me. There was no denying it. This was it. Either live or die trying. That thought alone allowed me to crawl behind a large tree trunk just before the man appeared where I had been lying moments ago. He looked around in confusion for a second, undoubtedly wondering where his prey had gone. Then he sniffed the air like a predator catching scent of its hiding meal before beginning his search. Struggling to suppress any noises and voluntary noises from the pain in my leg or from fear itself, I prayed that Erica would find help soon, before it was too late for both of us. As time seemed to stretch out endlessly, the man continued his hunt for me. The forest remained terrifyingly silent, save for the sounds of rustling leaves and the villain's sinister presence. Finally, a distant commotion caught my attention. Were it another day, I would have been able to hear sirens approaching, but not today. No, this sounded more like a handful of people shouting nearby. As abruptly as it had started, the villain's prowling came to a halt. The sudden silence was so deafening that I could almost feel my heart beating even louder in my chest. The stranger changed his course, heading towards the commotion like a moth drawn to flame. In those precious seconds, I dared hold my breath, fearing that any movement could bring him back towards me. But luck seemed to be on my side when moments later the figure disappeared into the darkness without turning back. My relief was overwhelming but short-lived as I remembered Erica and hoped she was safe. Pain shot through me once more as I attempted to stand up on my injured leg. No choice but to keep moving if we were going to survive this night. Leaning heavily on trees for support, I limped through the forest towards the noise. It took what felt like an eternity on uneven ground and hoarse breathing before I spotted something shining in the darkness. Tears of relief filled my eyes as I saw what appeared to be flashlights waving around in a distant clearing. Somehow, Erica had managed to find help in our darkest hour of need. An excruciating hour passed as we tended to our wounds and shared our horrifying encounter with the group who had arrived just in time, all while knowing deep down that we were incredibly lucky to be alive. Upon sharing our story with local authorities days later, they discovered that similar incidents had taken place within these woods over recent years. A man fitting our description had been linked to multiple violent attacks, managing to evade capture every time. As Erica and I recovered from our ordeal, we couldn't help but feel like we had narrowly escaped the clutches of an expert predator. While the woods may have hidden him from law enforcement, they could never erase the horrifying memories left behind for the countless survivors like Erica and me.